thank you so much, those in the room and those online. I'd um, like to welcome you to the uh, inaugural Kenya One Health Conference. And first, I'd like to invite my colleague, Dr. Bernard Bett, to um, start introducing the day. Thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot, Lian, and really a great pleasure to see all of you online and also in the room. So today we launch, uh, we, we commence our Kenya One Health Conference. And I still have two things only to do. One is, of course, to welcome you, but also to give you a short um, presentation, which clarifies what ORECA, which is the, the host um, project for this conference, does. My name is Bernard Beck, and I'm the team leader for the One Health Center in Africa. This is a project funded by BMZ. And of course, it's led by ILRI. And I wanted first to, look, to say who is ILRI before we come to the project. We know ILRI is one of the CGIAR institutions which uh, uses agriculture research to reduce poverty. Uh, and it's one of the 15 um, CGIAR centers which um, all constitute uh, that um, um, CG institutions. In, overall, we have up to 8,000 scientists, researchers, and technical staff who coordinate in one way or another to implement research on crops, livestock, um, environment, and many other sectors. Coming back to ORECA, of course, this is led by ILRI, and it, it's now in its second year of implementation. It was funded basically to do four main things, or before those four main things, the main focus is to enhance health of people, livestock, environment, and of course, uh, wildlife. But it has four main um, um, aspects. One is to support one Health initiatives, which have been set up in the sub-Saharan region where we are focusing on. And also it aims at building capacity on One Health through um, uh, studentships, also by working with communities and also by working with government institutions. Um, the third one is to continue uh, working on ongoing One Health projects. And these are mainly applied One Health research projects which aim to seek solutions on the ground. These are applied research, which then helps to formulate policies and practices, which the fourth component of uh, that objective um, uh, is on. Uh, just to come back closer into the specific activities, we have classified our work into four thematic areas and we call them food safety, emerging infectious diseases, neglected zoonosis, and AMR, that's antimicrobial resistance. Although these are thematic areas, we know there, there's really so much overlap. There's so much um, coordination across uh, these thematic areas, but we decided to classify them into those pillars for the sake of management and implementation of activities. And they also specifically focus on specific research questions, which sometimes are not necessarily uh, uh, cross-cutting um, in some cases. On capacity building, as I said earlier on, there are four, three main areas of interest, and one is uh, working with graduate fellows. Currently, we have already hired seven PhDs, five MSCs, and also working with um, uh, bachelors in some countries. And in addition to graduate fellowships and students, we also work with communities, and we really want to enhance dissemination of knowledge, working with communities on One Health, we have some satellite stations which we want to start that work immediately. And lastly, on behavior change communication, targeting value chain actors, and that could be seen to be part of the capacity strengthening um, uh, intervention. Lastly, on networks, I have a slide which follows that. And to say we started uh, this work last year where we were mapping One Health uh, networks in the region. And the region, of course, is Sub-Saharan Africa. And we already have a live uh, database, which we keep updating on which One Health is working where and what are their specific interests and how can ORECA work with them to further their interests in, in terms of uh, um, um, their influence on the ground. So that's basically what I wanted to say about ORECA. And we have a big team of thematic leaders. And you can see in the first row on the left side, including Ashni, Delia, Lian here with me, working as leaders of these thematic areas I mentioned. Uh, Dita Shilinka is our PI. And he has been leading the development of the project ever since it was launched uh, two years ago. 
and Hector is our communication together with Geoffrey. And Christina is also one of our coordinators who really works with um, our partners in Germany. Lastly, we have many graduate fellows and we have a few there, I think, whom we have currently on our website. That's one uh, component of the project theme leaders. But you also have um, a list of 10 advisory committee members who are really, be, we are very grateful for their uh, guidance and um, discussions which we have to shape how we implement the activities on the ground. So you will, if you will visit our website, you'll be able to see who those advisory committee members are, as well as their contacts. And, and that could be yeah, a good way of learning more. So let me stop there and share with you, um, of course, a link for our website where you can find more material on the One Health Center. So I want to hand over back to Lian to continue describing how the conference uh, will run. So thanks, uh, Lian. Thank you so much, Bernard. Um, so just a couple of housekeeping points um, before we proceed. So we're very lucky that we're joined by many participants on Zoom today. And so please, those of you on Zoom, um, mute your mics when you join. Um, if you're speaking remotely, please turn on your videos. Um, for the majority of participants, we would like to um, capture all your thoughts um, and contributions in the chat function and to note for everybody that this session is being recorded. So why, have, why are we here today and why are we having a Kenya One Health Conference? So uh, we came together um, as a RECA with um, many external partners um, and felt that it was really um, a great time um, with, with the global focus on One Health to really showcase what is going on in this space in Kenya. But as well as using these three days as a showcase for One Health work, we want to use it to dig a bit deeper and start to develop a framework for One Health research that is appropriate to the Kenyan context. Um, and so we wish to, to use three days over different topics to identify the initial elements for a demand-driven research agenda. Um, which will incorporate aspects of capacity strengthening and really reflect the needs of the policymakers um, here in, in the country. And we'll hear from many of them on day three. So the process, um, as, as you're aware from the agenda, we will have a combination of keynote speakers. We have selected presentations. We had a very strong showing of um, abstracts um, submitted to this conference but we will also utilize audience participation and um, you'll be introduced to, our, to the Mentimeter a little bit later, which will be one of the tools we used to capture um, all of your thoughts. Our messages at the end of the conference will be disseminated through a series of blogs on social media and please see our dedicated um, conference website. Um, if you want to share any, uh, join in the conversation, please tweet retweet, um, use these, um, the at areca underscore ILRI and the hashtag KOHC2021 to join in the conversation. I would really like to, to give a huge thanks to our organizing committee um, representing multiple um, institutions and um, One Health activities taking place here in Kenya. Everyone's given a, a huge amount of their val very valuable time to get this off the ground. And a particularly special mention to um, Nicholas Bohr, Rose Kellen and Jerry, Rose Manu and Jeffrey and Jenga, who have really been a, a massive powerhouse behind this. And with that, I would just like to thank you and now pass on to our Director General of ILRI, Dr. Jimmy Smith, to give some welcoming remarks as we kick off this conference. Thank you. And thank you, Jimmy. Thank you, Leanne. Colleagues, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're joining. I'm told there are many people online and I'm delighted that you are. So thank you, friends, partners, and colleagues. I'm very pleased to be participating in this. I'm glad to see this happening because I have had a strong interest in this area for a long time now. I became a firm convert to the One Health approach when I worked in the World Bank and had responsibility for trying to deal with the avian influenza and swine flu pandemics. Of course, the virtues of the One Health approach precedes us 
by many, many years. All of you who work in this area know that this term of one medicine was coined by Calvin Schwabe in the 60s, who saw the interaction between animals, the environment, and humans, and proceeded to think about this in the context of how you bring these two, three together to make the best of a health system that would serve all. Of course, since the days of Shoabi, the term metamorphosized into one health, and one health itself has had different definitions and different meanings to different people. Our definition is the one that we follow and was proposed by WHO, FAO, OIE, and UNEP. So it is a concept of delivering health at the interface of animals, humans, and the environment. It is no secret that despite the virtues which we see for the One Health approach, it has not progressed as rapidly as many of us would like. We know the virtues by working at this interface, and particularly in the context of zoonotic, zoonotic diseases, so much can be accomplished. In the case of Ilri and our partners, we see this not only in the context of managing pandemics or preventing them, but also dealing with the endemic diseases, which are so prevalent and so difficult for the smallholders whom we serve. So this approach of dealing with zoonotic and related diseases, not only endemics, but pandemics as well, has enormous, have enormous prospects that we must continue to pursue despite the slow progress with the One Health paradigm. So the question could be asked, if you are so smart, why aren't you rich? If One Health is so good, why isn't being pursued? And in the context of this conference, that's where I like to make a few more remarks. First of all, the issue is about funding. As you know, governments, whether they are development donors or national governments, we prioritize only the most important things we see at that moment. So when a disease comes as this one, the current pandemic has, costing the world trillions of dollars, we're mobilized to do something about it. But as soon as the risk or the challenge abates, we move on to something else. And that's been the problem with funding One Health. We respond only to the immediacy of the threat that confronts us. I think that needs to change. And governments, probably in the face of the expenditure that they've had to make in the context of the current pandemic, will ensure that we don't have to do this over and over. But it's not just the expenditure. It is the social and other dislocations that we suffered over this period and are still in the midst as the Omicron has become evident. So hopefully funding will be more and more reliable. But the second area I think that militates against getting one help going is the differing view of what it really is. And I hope that this conference will coalesce around the definition that is put forward by the organizations I just mentioned, the One Health concept elaborated by FAO, WHO, OIE, and, and UNEP. And it's the one we should use, I believe. Because if we use the definitions of One Health that so many others use, that includes soil health, plant health, this concept becomes so large that it collapses on its own weight. So let's keep a definition that is manageable, operationally, operationalizable, 
and so on. So funding the definition. The third thing that we must tackle is the disciplinary insularity that abounds in this area. The vets and the medics don't work very well together. The vets and the rest of animal agriculture don't work well together. The vets and the environmental scientists don't work together. And all of us, our discipline is paramount. I think we need to put this aside. This has been a big constraint to moving One Health. I'm sure we are guilty of this in this conference, that the vast majority of people who would be joining this conference are probably animal people. We need to get more vets, more environmentalists involved. And so this is a challenge for us as we move forward. We must break down the disciplinary insularity that abounds because that also set up insularity at the institutional level. We need institutions that ask what needs to be done rather than what is my role in the case of an urgent pandemic. We have to get better institutional and policy arrangements and get governments working better together. We all know the dog's breakfast we've confronted with respect to the current pandemic. Every country has its own regulations about travel, coming and going. Every country approaches things slightly different. This is terrible for business and for the public. We also know that one of the big virtues of the One Health approach in dealing with pandemics in particular is that if we were able to detect diseases early, then the cost of controlling them is much, much reduced. If we were able to find out that this virus started in Wuhan and been able to contain it there, then the rest of the world wouldn't have been. And so we can say, but many other pandemics which has preceded these. Early detection is the key. Therefore, surveillance is the key. Early notification is the key. Yet, as we've seen with Omicron, the minute you notify others about a threat, they close the borders. And so who would notify anyone about something that is about to happen if the first thing that happens is punitive? This needs to stop. We need some mechanism where governments will agree about early notification, Surveillance that works, help the developing countries that don't have the capability to do surveillance. And as we proposed in one of my early documents in the World Bank, some sort of a fund that is contributed to, so that countries which suffer from an early notification and other punitive measures can draw on that fund for compensate for its losses. So we have a lot of institutional work. And let me end on this point. We must act in solidarity. We cannot end whether endemic or pandemic diseases without solidarity. So we must act in solidarity. So the challenge before us that we've been grappling with at Ilri, and I know many partners are, and I hope this conference will imbibe and take forward, is that not only do we have to do the good technical work, such as perhaps vaccines in the future for, for family of diseases rather than individual viruses, better surveillance, better capacity building, and all the work that OREC is going to take forward. Those are all very good technical stuff, but we also have to deal with many of the institutional challenges, which I spoke about, breaking down the insularity, breaking down the institutional boundaries, working in solidarity. So creating institutions and institutional framework, which help us to act in solidarity. So I'm very happy 
to see this conference, the, the, the potential of this paradigm is great. We need it. We know we need it. And so the work that is going to be done is critical, not only to Ilri, to Africa, to farmers, but for all of us everywhere, as we learned from this recent pandemic. So Leanne, back to you. And thank you much for the opportunity to make these few remarks at this very important conference. Thank you so much, Jimmy, for your time and your wonderful remarks. I think it's, it's uh, following from that, um, I'm really happy that um, this morning we can welcome for our keynote speak, speaker, someone who really is exemplifying the solidarity um, that Jimmy has, has so rightly suggested we need. You mentioned that Vex and, Vex and medics don't always work that well together. And we're now going to hear from a veterinarian who is working in a medical institution um, and developing vaccines which are appropriate for use across that divide in both livestock and humans. Professor, Professor George Warimwe Wei is a, a veterinarian who is the, a PI at the Kemri Wellcome Trust Unit here in, in Kalifi and is a prof assistant professor in the Center for Tropical Medicine and Global Health at the University of Oxford. Um, he has just been um, awarded an incredible prize by the Royal Society, the Royal Society Africa Prize for his work on viral zoonoses. And he's going to talk to us today, today about his experience as um, uh, someone who crosses these boundaries and the development um, of a Rift Valley fever vaccine suitable for use in humans and livestock. So with that, I would like to pass across um, to Professor George Wurimwe, and um, we're really looking forward to hearing from you today. So thank you so much. Thank you, Leanne. And th I'd like to first start by thanking all the organizers for this uh, fantastic conference. Uh, I mean, One Health has been on the fringes for a very long time, but uh, it's now sort of center stage, and this is our opportunity to really push this um, uh, agenda that really makes sense in terms of disease control. So um, I really like, you know, following Jimmy Smith's uh, talk, I mean, that's, that's going to be a tough act, but there are some things that he mentioned about siloed thinking and uh, in all the sort of different facets that uh, we deal with, with in health. And, you know, my, my view of One Health in this space of vaccinology is looking at developing vaccines for humans through the lens of animal health and vice versa. So if you're developing vaccines for veterinary, you know, for veterinary use, looking at the, um, the impact of those vaccines and the development process from a, from a human perspective. So um, I'm going to talk about a program that I've been working on for a while now. So this started sometime in 2012, which, which tells you about the, the sort of scale of time that you need to develop uh, vaccines and, and also speaks to the sort of rapid development of COVID vaccines that we have seen, because that has been shrunk down to about 100 days. So it's about developing a single vaccine for use in um, humans and livestock against Rift Valley fever. This audience, I don't think I need to talk about um, Sorry, myself. Okay, I don't think I need to talk about the the importance of animals to uh, to human health for this particular audience. In fact, this this is a photo taken uh, uh, among a collection of lots of photos on the Ilri flicker site. So I would urge you all to look it, to look at that. It's got fantastic. Um, visual uh, representations of the importance of animal health to humans. And I like this photo because it just demonstrates the pure joy that animals bring to, to humans, especially children. But of course, we also know about the, the economic importance, the, you know, there's been lots of studies demonstrating the uh, impact of life, uh, you know, animals to livelihoods, financial security. I always mention that I, I was any, only able to go to university because my grandparents who raised me own an animal and they saw that animal and that uh, generated income you know, some, some funding for me to go to university. And I'm sure there are many others in the audience who have uh, similar stories. But one of the other things we share with uh, livestock are infectious diseases. In fact, over 60% of 
infectious diseases or in humans have uh, involved an animal uh, sort of transmission. And uh, for the emerging infectious diseases that we're seeing now that, you know, that are increasing in incidence, that percentage is much higher. So um, when you're thinking about controlling human disease, it, it, it just illustrates the point that you also have to think about uh, animal health just because of that uh, uh, connection. Um, so I'm going to talk about Rift Valley Fever, which is a virus that was identified in Kenya in uh, the 1930s. It is an RNA virus in the family Fenuviridae. Um, there are no vaccines available for it or no specific therapeutics, uh, which is why it has been prioritized by the African Union and the World Health Organization. So um, RVF is, is, has a complex transmission cycle uh, by complexity, meaning that, you know, for me, it involves quite a lot of uh, mammalian species and lots of um, mosquito species. So, but the simplistic sort of explanation is that you have very heavy rainfall that causes floods, which increases uh, the number of mosquitoes um, to, to transmit the virus. Sorry, um, so able to, to uh, transmit the virus. This um, increase in mosquito numbers uh, allows a mechanism for the virus to circulate in, in animals. Some of the mosquitoes are infected you know, for life. The eggs are, you know, the, if they had had a blood meal uh, that has infectious virus, the virus has um, you know, gone through its progeny through the eggs. Uh, and so the virus transmits, uh, I mean, the mosquitoes transmit the virus uh, in animal species, most commonly sheep, goats, cattle, and camels. And during these epidemics where, where you have very high levels of viremia, uh, viral load circulating in these animals, uh, the viruses can then, the mosquitoes can then transmit the virus to humans uh, or also to wildlife. Now, the virus um, sort of has been detected in wildlife by way of sero seroprevalence studies, but the impact of RVF in, in livestock is really not uh, fully understood. But in domestic ruminants, like you know the ones I've mentioned, you, you get the uh, to about adult animals, and of course, in young animals, the mortality is much higher. This is over ninety percent, and you know the classic, uh, the classic sort of hallmark of disease is uh, abortion storm. So nearly all animals in a farm that are pregnant would abort. In humans, the disease um, is described more like a um, flu-like illness with very non-specific symptoms, but a proportion of these individuals develop severe disease with high case fatality rates. And, and it, it, there's been some sort of uh, evidence, uh, although anecdotal, suggesting that the case fatality has been, you know, of recent uh, epidemics in humans uh, has been rather high. So ranging from about 30%, at least for from the East African uh, uh, outbreaks. So where is RVF common? It's predominantly in Africa. And um, these maps, you know, are like you would have seen maps like this for all sorts of things. Basically, the darker it is, the, the more uh, cases there are or have been reported. Uh, on the left, you've got humans. On the right, you have livestock. The most important thing here to note is that there is a lot more um, cases of RVF reported in livestock uh, than in humans, which possibly just illustrates the, the poor sort of surveillance systems in, in humans in some of these settings. Uh, the other thing you will note, if, you will note is that uh, Kenya and South Africa or East Africa and Southern Africa tend to be really severely affected by RVF outbreaks just based on the number over the previous years. So what can we do to control RVF? Uh, we have licensed uh, inactivated uh, vac and live vaccines for their use in, in livestock. Uh, these have some safety drawbacks and uh, some need multiple doses to uh, generate an effective immune response. You need high containment for their production because it's an actual sort of RVF virus that you're dealing with, whether inactivating it or modified in some way. Um, and it's not, they're not DIVA compatible. So you cannot differentiate uh, vaccinated animals from um, non-vaccinated animals because the antibody response to the whole virus is similar to that that's caused by natural infection. So there are no licensed vaccines for human use. And so 
the 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 thrust of this program has really been about developing a vaccine for for human use, but also developing safer uh, vaccines that can be used in livestock. This is a very old um, uh, table from the 1930s. Just the, all I want to demonstrate here is that. Uh, a humoral immune response, so an antibody response is sufficient for protection. Uh, because of time, I, I won't really go into the table, but, they, but you, you, the point I want to sort of make is that if you pass that into animals, again, you can confer protection. Uh, suggesting that antibodies are important. We also have from very many studies that have been done uh, over the years, demonstrating that neutralizing antibodies uh, correlate with protection. And so if you're thinking about a target for a vaccine uh, you know, construct, you want to develop antibodies, you know, develop a vaccine that can elicit neutralizing antibodies. And we finally, we know that uh, if you recover from RVF infection, then these neutralizing antibodies tend to be long-lived. And this is just a, a case demonstrating that uh, an individual had neutralizing antibodies up to 25 years later without um, uh, exposure in the intervening period, which is uh, really remarkable. So we know what the, the target of these neutralizing antibodies are. It's the surface of the viral glycoprotein of the, of the virus. Now, these are viral glycoproteins known as GN and GC. Uh, the, the, the analogous uh, sort of situation here is the spike protein for coronavirus. So it's like targeting the same sort of surface of the virus. It's an enveloped RNA uh, virus. So we set out to use the Chadox-1 platform uh, because at that time, the Chadox-1 uh, vaccine platform, which is basically just a vehicle to deliver the vaccine, had been used in humans and uh, had been shown to be safe in humans. This is very important as a, as a sort of starting point for a human vaccine because you've already uh, saved so much costs by having uh, already a track record in, in the safety profile. Uh, you will, uh, I will talk about the costs of developing vaccines later. But the Chadox-1 platform uh, was safe in humans uh, previously when used for other vaccines. And all we did basically is get the targets, the, the genes that encode the virus uh, RVF, GN, and GC, and uh, you, you know, inserted this into the Chadox-1 uh, vector, which when, in, when you vaccinate an individual, gets into the cell, uh, expresses the, the proteins, and these uh, RVF glycoproteins then uh, stimulate an immune response, and hopefully you've got a very high immune response to confer protection. So the methods of manufacture were already well established, so it really was a, a matter of plug and play. So this image just illustrates the, um, the, the sort of uh, pipeline for development. It's, it's simplistic, uh, but it just illustrates the point. We've had the preclinical uh, discovery period where we identified the RVF, I mean, inserted the RVF, GN, and GC into the Chadox-1 platform. Uh, the plan was to do preclinical studies in mice uh, and then go on to livestock trials and, and human studies. And, and if you know, hopefully, if it all works well, then you'd have a single vaccine uh, for using multiple species. So um, the first uh, really encouraging data we found was that uh, if you immunize mice and expose them to RVF virus uh, two months later, uh, you had 100% protection, and um, the, you know this was very exciting. Whereas the group that uh, were given a placebo uh, did not, uh, you know, were not protected and succumbed to infection. So the next sets of uh, studies in, in livestock were studies that we did um, in very close partnership uh, with ILRI, uh, with Vishnene and others. And the idea here was to immunize animals and following, um, follow them up for a month for immune response to, to develop and then expose them to RVF virus. So this is a typical approach of evaluating vaccines. So the long and short of it was that a single immunization uh, in all those species provided 100% protection. So none of the animals that received Chadox-1 
um, develop disease. And in fact, as illustrated on this on this plot, the with the blue representing Chadox One group and the black representing the licensed product and the uh, gray representing placebo, all the Chadox One vaccinated animals mounted a neutralizing antibody response. Uh, for the Rift Vax, which is available in Kenya as a you know RVF vaccine, uh, two of the animals, one in you know cattle and and goats, did not mount a neutralizing response and were not protected. Further supporting this idea that um, neutralizing antibodies are the main sort of thing you need to elicit to uh, mount an immune response. So the publication is up there if anybody wants to, to follow that. So uh, the next step was to look at uh, RVF in pregnancy, again, using a similar uh, ex experimental design where you vaccinate. Uh, for this, we vaccinated early in gestation and challenge them later with a, with, a, with a virulent virus and then monitoring the safety of the fetus and also uh, protection. So these studies were done in the Netherlands with uh, 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 Jerome Kotekas and others. Um, and the top uh, panels represent the results of the vaccine development in, in sheep um, and the bottom are the goats. So the both, I mean, in both species, the, the antibody response was uh, really very high. It was within the range we observed in the Kenyan study uh, at Ilri. Um, and and uh, the, the Chadox-1 vaccinated group in red here were, um, were protected against uh, viremia. So you see the viral load there. It just means that the animals were protected against um, you know, RVF infection. There was no illness in the pregnant uh, animals um, and no sign of infection in the fetuses in, in sheep. Um, in the goats, again, we, got, we had very high levels of uh, protection, although two of the 25 uh, fetuses uh, succumbed to infection, suggesting that there might be uh, differences in the uh, either the mechanism of protection or, or other factor in, in goats in terms of uh, uh, the level of protection that you see following vaccination. But the primary aim of this uh, experiment really was to demonstrate that the Chadox-1 vaccine was safe, which is something that current, uh, you know, most of the vaccines currently uh, are unable to, you know, show, you know, that we, we really don't have any vaccines that can be used in pregnancy other than uh, the inactivated versions that need uh, multiple immunizations. So this was a really um, good point to sort of uh, get that, you know, proceed from. Uh, yeah, so uh, the next step was to look at the now that we've demonstrated the um, the safety of the product in uh, in pregnant and non-pregnant animals and showed the, you know very high levels of protection, we the next step was to conduct a, a field trial, looking at the um, uh, whether the vaccine elicits uh, a similar you know performs as well as the licensed product in a study that is powered to evaluate that at a sort of uh, a population level. So the previous studies were designed to look at efficacy, uh, you know, for the first study, and the, the second one was to look at safety in pregnancy, whereas this is now looking at a field level. And these are studies that we did in uh, Kapiti, where we um, looked at 100, uh, 180 animals per species. So this is with the, as, as indicated there, there was a study protocol. And this study was done to very high levels, very high standards, so uh, to GCP. Uh, and I believe it's probably the largest uh, sort of GCP veterinary trial that's been done globally. Uh, I haven't had anybody object to that in the different places I've, I've talked about this. Um, so uh, as I say, the study is done in Kenya, it's, it's in healthy and pregnant animals and the animals were followed up for a year. And the end point of the trial, the, the thing that we will use to say whether the vaccine performs as well as a licensed product is a neutralizing antibody titers. Now, I don't have the results for this, but um, analysis is underway, uh, but should be available sometime early next year. But the whole point is that this data will be used to support the registration of the product for use in East Africa and other, and other countries uh, in Africa where there is very high uh, sort of exposure to RVF. 
So I'll switch gears a bit. So now we're moving to humans. So the, the veterinary development is of course very advanced. Uh, and we are now you know, at the point where we're thinking about registration. But how about the human study? So we began a phase one study uh, in humans in Oxford. And this is uh, the typical uh, approach is to start with a low dose, go to a medium dose and a high dose. For any of you who've been following uh, you know, the Oxford AstraZeneca COVID-19 vaccine development, you would have seen some of these sort of experimental designs uh, or trial designs very early on. So this, this sort of phase one study is, is done in a small number of participants with the aim of just looking at the safety profile of the product. And of course, whether it also elicits an immune response, the desired immune response. So we already have for the platform in general, so Chadox one in general, we already have over safety database over a billion doses, of course, because of the Oxford AstraZeneca COVID vaccine. But now we want to add data specific to the RVF vaccine. And so far the vaccine is performing well, both in terms of the safety uh, and, and the immune response. And again, we expect this data to be ready you know, for sort of dissemination uh, sometime early next year. So I've, I've taken that fairly quickly just because of time, but the, but the summary of this work is that, uh, you know, we've uh, identified very high levels of protection in livestock. Uh, the vaccine is highly uh, efficacious and safe in pregnant uh, ruminants. Uh, and the safety and immunogenicity is expected to be as good as current licensed vaccine, which is the sort of the smith band vaccine supplied by uh, Kevevapi analysis is ongoing, as is the analysis of the human phase one study uh, that uh, is going to be available as from next year. So in terms of, so for the veterinary uh, development, the veterinary use of the product, um, that has a clear sort of pathway um, that we would follow for the, um, as stipulated by uh, the local regulators um, and, you know, NBA, the, the Veterinary Medicines Directorate, and, and sort of, and there is a actually a harmonized process for, for doing this in Eastern Africa. But how about the, the human landscape? Now, one of the most difficult things to do, as, as you know, the audience might appreciate, is to predict when the next um, Rift Valley fever outbreak would be. If you, if, if you are to predict that with very high sort of confidence, you would be able to design uh, a vaccine efficacy study. So, um, but in the absence of that, it becomes really difficult to predict, uh, you know, to design a, a vaccine efficacy study for you for uh, RVF. So an alternative approach would be to uh, use uh, correlates of protection as done for other vaccines. So we know, you know, the threshold, the antibody threshold you require to provide protection against rabies, for instance, and even yellow fever, for instance. Um, another, another route is to think about an animal rule, which is something that's done by the FDA in the US. But uh, because this is a problem, RVF is a problem that's predominantly restricted to Africa and the Arabian Peninsula. I think we think that there is a need to engage the regulatory um, uh, national regulatory authorities in the continent about the, the best sort of strategy towards licensure of this vaccine, whether it's uh, emergency use authorization, as we have seen, as we have seen for uh, COVID-19, uh, and then followed by sort of a, 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 um, a phase three study where you're looking at uh, efficacy evaluation if ever there was a massive uh, sort of epidemic. You also need to think about what vaccination regimen uh, is going to be eventually used. And so this relies on doing um, uh, further studies, phase two studies, where you look at uh, uh, a single dose versus two doses and, and uh, which of those performs well, and think about the deployment and how would you deploy this vaccine? Would you deploy it in humans only, or would you deploy it in humans and animals during an epidemic? And, you know, this sort of thing calls for, uh, you know, massive stakeholder engagement, including the bodies listed there. So very much a One Health focused sort of uh, um, strategy strategy also, not just the, in the making of the vaccine and, and the planning of the experiment, but also in the future work on the deployment of, of the product. So I think uh, we'll stop there. Um, sorry. Yeah, I'll stop there and just acknowledge that this is work that has involved 
um, very many partners and uh, at the center of this has been the International Livestock Research Institute, very close partners there, uh, as I mentioned earlier, but also I can just or not, I cannot overstate the importance of uh, engagement with the um, regulatory and policy stakeholders, including the National Biosafety Authority and the Ministry of Agriculture, Livestock and Fisheries, because this would not have been possible without their support um, and you know and, and guidance through the through the process uh, at Ilri, uh, you know, Campus and Kapiti. So I think I'll stop there and uh, hand it over back to you, Leanne, or, or um, for any uh, other questions. Thank you so much, George, for that great great talk. Um, and uh, there's lots of questions in the chat, um, but I'm going to just jump in uh, with one that's maybe a little bit less technical. We talked a bit at the beginning about the, the difficulty of breaking down silos. So I'm gonna ask you a personal question. Um, as as a, a veterinarian um, now working at Kemri, how, how have you felt, how have you found that transition sort of moving from the veterinary field into um, sort of medical research. How, and have you got any um, suggestions for those of us here or online about talking across disciplines and making those, forging those connections? Thank you. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I think um, the, the first thing to say is I, is I never left veterinary medicine. My background is I'm a vet, as you said, and I think the the uh, I have sort of um, enthused colleagues at Camry and and others you know that I collaborate with uh, globally about the value of uh, animal health, not just from the perspective of you know at, at the public you know deployment. Because when you think of one health, there, there is a there's a big sort of bias, I think, towards thinking of control programs, like a, a con you're deploying a control programs for brucellosis and you have to think about both. But I think I've been accusing people to think about more even at the basic level that there are difference in, differences in uh, animals and humans in terms of the uh, immune, sort of the way they mount an immune response, the components of the immune response. So you can understand pathogens and and how you know to con how to control pathogens uh, by looking at how the host paras you know host parasite or host virus interaction differs in the different species so it's been more about showing a different way of thinking about the particular problem that uh, you know colleagues are working on uh, and applying this sort of one health um, basically exploiting synergies in in uh, in sort of immunology in both humans and, and livestock it's not necessarily easy but it, it to me it just makes sense yeah no that that's wonderful and very sort of reminiscent of that original one medicine um concept and and also very great to hear that you never feel that you've left veterinary medicine i'm sorry if that was what came across i always have uh, have this myself where people said oh you're in research maybe you're not a vet anymore but we're still we're still veterinarians at heart um so i'm just going to pick up on a couple of questions that came in the chat um so uh, there was one question that uh, suggested that given the um the prolonged drought followed by um very heavy rains that we've experienced in the country you know does this make you feel that an outbreak might be more likely and if so is there anything people should be considering to protect themselves or protect prepare yeah i mean i think that's again is a, is a good question um there are others in the audience you know bernard bet and others who can make a, a really informed decision based on the sort of mathematical modeling and predictions i think i will i would emphasize more uh rather than moving rather than thinking about you know is there an outbreak that's going to happen because of these uh, conditions i think i would emphasize being ready all the time which is uh, something that uh Jimmy mentioned in, in his uh, sort of introduc introdu introduction that we need to be ready. We need to have surveillance systems that are ready to sort of uh, go uh, without necessarily um, sort of having to wait for a set of circumstances to come to come into sort of existence. So you can always, if we have surveillance systems that are full you know that are not just focused on a particular disease not just focused on rvf then you will be able to respond quickly 
um, irregardless of whether there's a drought or whether there is not. I think I would emphasize more on having um, uh, that of, you know, everyday sort of readiness to address sort of uh, outbreaks. I don't know whether I'm making sense there, other yes. than focusing more just on an RVF outbreak. Yeah, absolutely. I think that that's really clear that we really need to put um, our, our efforts into preparedness and surveillance. Um, George, I would like to just thank you ever so much. I could keep you here all day asking questions, but I do note that our time is moving on. I hope that you will be joining us through the conference. There are several um, questions addressed to you in the chat. If, if you're able to spend a bit of time um, and, and provide some answers to those, that would be really um, appreciated. And thank you again for your really great um, impact. If I could give you one more round of applause from this end. Thank you. I, I would like now we um, we would be moving to an introduction to the Mentimeter, but we actually have um, the Director General of the Ministry of Health online who would like to give some um, uh, uh, some additional opening remarks. We're very lucky that he was able to make it today. Um, so we're just going to um, share his screen and hand over for a couple of um, remarks from Ms., uh, from Dr. Amoff. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> My name is Philip Ngere. I work with the Ministry of Health, uh, the Division of Disease Surveillance and Response. Uh, I manage the Public Health uh, Emergency Operations Center and I also coordinate event based surveillance. I'm here to deliver the opening remarks for the uh, Dr. Amok, our Director General, who is uh, away on official duties in Zanzibar and was not able to, uh, to make it for this conference uh, physically or virtually at the moment. So if you allow, then I could go ahead and deliver his remarks. The organizers of the Kenya One Health Conference, uh, fellow panelists, conference participants, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Good morning, uh, good afternoon for those of us uh, who are in the afternoon. Thank you for inviting me to this panel discussion on One Health policy implementation, focusing on the human health perspective. The One Health approach recognizes the close, close connection between the health of humans, animals, and the environment. For example, we know that more than 75% of emerging and emerging infectious diseases are zoonotic in origin. The recurrent uh, Rift Valley fever outbreaks and the recent findings of the, of the Middle East uh, Respiratory Syndrome, MASCO, in humans are good local examples of these threats. Besides emerging and emerging infections, other important drivers of One Health approach include the threat of antimicrobial resistance and food safety issues. Mainstreaming One Health, mainstreaming the One Health approach requires a conducive policy environment. Mm -hmm. While Kenya has no One Health policy, the One Health approach is often incorporated in sector policies and plans. In 20, 2000, in the year 2020, with the support of the food uh, agriculture organized food and agriculture organization the zoonotic disease unit conducted a one health policy analysis the report is due for stakeholder validation validation the analysis reviewed policies including con the constitution of kenya 2010 kenya health policy 2014 to 2030 the national policy uh, on prevention and containment of antimicrobial resistance 2017, national food safety policy 2013, and the vision 2030, third medium term plan. Some of, some of the pre preliminary findings show that most policies in human health, veterinary health and wildlife sectors either have explicit or implied One Health interventions. However, the constitution of Kenya 2010, the vision 2030, 
and the environmental policies were found to lack any explicit or implied One Health linkages. The Kenya Health Policy 2014-2030 to has three One Health related objectives. One is to eliminate, eliminate communicable conditions. Two is to minimize expo exposure to health risk factors. And lastly, to strengthen collaboration with the private and other health related sectors. While One Health is not explicitly mentioned, the policy recognizes the importance of collaboration between sectors to enable Kenyans attain the highest standards of health. On policies and strategies on zoonotic disease control, the government of Kenya established the Zoonotic Disease Unit in 2012 through a memorandum of understanding between the Ministry of Public Health and Sanitation and the Ministry of Livestock Development. A strategic plan 2012-2017 was launched in 2012 to guide activities of the Zoonotic Disease Unit. And the strategy has been reviewed and updated and updated and an updated plan developed to cover the year 2021 to 2025. The updated strategy has three objectives. To establish structures and partnerships to promote One Health, to strengthen surveillance, prevention and control of zoonosis, and to conduct and promote applied research. On zoonotic disease control, Still, several disease-specific plans have been developed in the last 10 years, and this include Rift Valley Fever Contingency Plan developed in 2014, Rabies Elimination Strategy for 2014 to 2030, Brucellosis, Brucellosis Prevention and Control Strategy for the year 2021 to 2040, and Anthrax Prevention and on Control strategy for the year 2021 to 2036. Other strategies that have been developed for diseases like, like highly pathogenic uh, avian influenza, Ebola, Marburg, plague, amongst others. There are also policies and strategies that have been developed on antimicrobial resistance. Great strides have been made to this end in creating policy environment that fosters one health approach in tackling anti antimicrobial resistance. The national health policy on prevention and containment of antimicrobial resistance and the national action plan were developed in 2017. The AMR policy was the first policy to be developed while fully embracing One Health approach. Additional policy documents include the National Integrated Antimicrobial Stewardship Plan, that's for the year 2021 to 2026, and the National Infection Prevention and Control Policy Strategic Plan for the year 2021 to 2026. Policies have also been uh, drafted uh, on, on, on food safety and security. The national food safety policy was developed in 2013 to establish and maintain a food safety system that harmonizes interagency efforts. Various laws support safety, uh, including the Food, Drugs and Substance Act, uh, that is CAP 254, the Public Health Act, that's CAP 242, and the Meat Control Act, which is CAP 316. In conclusion, therefore, ladies and gentlemen, Kenya has a conducive policy environment for mainstreaming One Health. However, developing a standalone One Health policy has benefits, as this will anchor One Health at the highest level. Alternatively, we can ensure most existing and all new policies 
and strategies in health, veterinary, and environment sectors in corporate One Health. Thank you. Thank you so, so much, Dr. Ngeri, for your um, interjection here on behalf of the Director General um, Ministry of Health. This is uh, really, really positive news how um, strong the policy environment is for One Health in Kenya, but as you've identified, there are still some gaps to be filled. We really appreciate your time in, in joining us to open this uh, conference today. Um, I would, just before I pass to um, Michael Victor, I would just like to recognize the presence of several of our advisory, uh, advisory committee members from ARECA. So thank you so much for making the time to join us um, for this important conference. So now I'd like to pass to Michael Victor to introduce us to the Mentimeter, um, one of our key uh, audience um, engagement tools. Thank you very much, Michael. Right. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Michael Victor, and I'm the head of communications and knowledge management at ILRI. Uh, I'd like also to bring up my, uh, you know, uh, my assistant here, uh, Nicholas Bohr, who is going to actually be doing uh, Menti with you for the rest of the, the conference, but I'm just going to kick it off. Uh, so, Okay. Oh, well, just say hello. To everybody. <laughs> hello, everyone, and welcome on board. Yeah. So we hope to have an inter interactive session with you all. Thanks. Okay. Okay. okay, great. So just really briefly, Mentimeter is just an interactive tool where we really can crowdsource ideas uh, and really engage the audience in real time. So we're going to be using this uh, to, to really ensure that the One House con uh, Conference we, the One Health Conference, we really get participant feedback and engagement so as to develop a, a One Health research agenda for Kenya or emerging one. And we heard from uh, Jimmy today that, you know, One Health has many different ideas and many different kind of dimensions to it. So we want to bring everybody's perceptions and ideas together. And this is one way that we'll be doing that. So we'll have a lot of presentations, but we expect to get a lot of feedback too. So there's a lot of ways that we'll do that. And you'll see this throughout the conference. We'll be using uh, spectrums, you know, so you can kind of gauge how people feel across the spectrum. We'll be using word tags. Uh, we'll be just getting people's uh, perceptions and ideas through open-ended questions. And then we have multiple choice. So there's a lot of ways to gauge and get feedback here. So we're gonna start it out. I hope everyone has either downloaded the app, gone to the app store and downloaded it on their phone. I see someone just uh, going to their phone now, which is great. So you can download it on your app store, just type in Menti and you'll get it. Or you can go to uh, menti.com and then you just put in that code there. So it's 56857347, okay? Uh, so our first question, we're just gonna get people used to to using uh, the Menti. So an easy question. Let's see where people are from. I, we expect to see Kenya at the uh, uh, kind of right in the middle, but it'd be good to see what other countries where people are joining us from. So you start to see, you can just type in one word. Uh, I think for this one, we just had one, one word that you could type in because you're, uh, people are coming from one country. So great to see, look at we, we, someone from Bangladesh, which is great, Zambia, Malta, excellent. Australia, it must be really late in Australia. What time is it in Australia right now about? Not so late, okay. It's about six, seven hours, yeah? About seven o'clock at night. Okay, uh, United Kingdom, Netherlands, Malta, excellent. How many people? So we have 74 people. How many people online? So we have 419 people online, which is, which is great to see. Let's get it up there. Let's get people. We have 83. Let's get up to 100 at least. See where people are. We have Chris. Is that a new country? Yeah, that might be a new country. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, good. Just to practice out and see if we're uh, catching these things. Uh, I'd like to see the flag for Chris. What's the national flag for Chris? Uh, great. Okay, we're up to 100. Uh, is that a good sample size, Eric? 100 out of 25%? Uh, you know, okay. Okay, let's go to the next uh, question. Who 
which sector do you work in? And we have a couple of different uh, options here, academic, non-academic research, public sector, private sector, uh, NGO or other. Let's see what we get. Great to see a lot of people joining in here. Let's get it up to at least 150 this time. Again, if you're trying to get on, just go to your app store, uh, whether you're on a uh, Android or on a Ma uh, Apple and just download Menti. Uh, it takes a couple of seconds and then input the code that's right there. Uh, or you can go on your computer and just go to www.menti.com. Great, we're getting up there. A lot of academics, great to see private sector. That's always a missing sector within the One Health. So it's really nice to see uh, the private sector there. Uh, if you're from the other, put in your chat what other means. It'd be interesting to see what other means. NGO is really good, non-academic research, interesting, okay. So it's a good mix. It's not just all academics and researchers, which is, which is good to see. Let's get up to 150. Okay, let's, uh, again, we're gonna be doing a, a, a word cloud here, I think. Uh, what is your main discipline? So again, one of the big things about One Health is that it's trans transdisciplinary. Uh, so we wanna see what types of disciplines we have. Is it multidisciplinary or transdisciplinary, Bernard? Trans, okay, so I got it right. Okay, good. Uh, so let's see what we have here. We have a lot of veterinarians, epidemiologists. I see a medical research, which is great. Food safety, anthropology, good. Vaccinology, sociology. So a lot from the vet side. Science communication, that's great to see. A really important part of One Health. Huh. A, me is, is that a meteorologist, that's great. To weather the environment, excellent. Uh, program management, we need that. Product development, excellent. Bernard, do you see, is this the type of group you want to see in a One Health approach? Are we missing anybody? Yeah, I think we are missing a few, like, you know, public health. Uh, well, it's mainly the, we see epidemiology, veterinary environment, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, great. I saw a molecular biologist, which is great. Wildlife health, really down below. So a little bit of environment, environmental management to low again. Uh, we see a lot from the vet side. So quite interesting here to see, keep on going. 184, we really got up. So great, uh, excellent. And one more. So let's start to just get people's, you can write your own. What is your own definition of One Health? Let's see what we start to get up here. And, uh, you know, Bernard or Leon, maybe you can, if you jump in, if you see anything of interest here uh, as well, just let us know. Okay, so using the definition from, uh, you know, the, the One Health Group, it's the interaction between animal and human and the environment. A nice comment here on uh, recognizing the sort of interconnectedness of all things. So uh -huh. everything is linked. Yeah. A lot of great, um, you know, we see multidisciplinary coming up a lot integration another great word so people do recognize that this the real integration interdisciplinariness uh cross sector we're not seeing some of the other ones uh we'll come up but here we go we're starting to get quite a few it's the interaction the mashup that's a good word uh it's it's not just the interaction but it's the mashup i think that's that's important to see as well uh let's see if we get some more moving up here quickly uh, you know, it's collaborative effort to achieve optimal health, multidisciplinary, deliberate collaboration. I think deliberate's an interesting word, which is good. Uh, being deliberate about how you approach it and how you bring it together. Okay, I think we're done here. So again, Nicholas will be your uh, mentee man for the rest of the couple of uh, the next couple of days. And again, really try to use this because we want to build up a story and we want your participation and your thoughts and ideas to be really able to develop this collaborative research agenda and get some priorities going on from this. So really use this as your opportunity to get your voice uh, heard. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michael, for introducing us to Mentimeter, which we'll be all very familiar with by the end of these three days. So now I'm going to open up the first of our flash talk sessions for the conference. 
Um, so hopefully we should hear from our pre-recorded three minute flash talks. Thank you so much. Thank you to the conference organizers for the opportunity to present this qualitative work exploring the risks for urban Rift Valley fever invasion car carried out in Kenya by me, Kelly Gherkin, and my colleagues listed here. So the Rift Valley fever virus is a zoonotic virus that can be transmitted by mosquitoes, but also directly to humans from infected livestock. And with this current distribution of exposure studies, it's been difficult to, to disentangle the role that consumption and handling of animal products has in transmission. But in a recent community survey at our two urban sites in Kenya, we found risk factors were independent of livestock ownership. And despite Rift Valley fever spread and introduction being really driven by animal movement, no urban outbreaks have ever been documented. So the main objective of this study was to explore potential pathways of introduction from the perspective of those that would likely experience it first and understand how they perceive their personal risk. So we carried out focus group discussions with these high-risk groups, which included slaughterhouse workers, livestock owners, and those people that purchase blood and animal products directly from the slaughterhouse for urban distribution. And this study generated a ton of data, but just to quickly highlight a few key points, livestock are still important for livelihoods, but with more of a focus on business opportunity. So there may be some disincentive to report. Animal products are also included in that business opportunity and are a less expensive way to consume animal protein. Blood was not just used for making sausage, but was also consumed by um, pregnant women and people with low iron, raw directly from the slaughterhouse. And then we also found that grazers arrived near our site seasonally coming from hotspots like Caggiato and Garissa. And some had livestock uh, owners that were already having mitigation efforts in place, such as removing ticks from their animals after they grazed with those animals. All of the groups, particularly at the slaughterhouse, perceived risk of zoonotic transmission to be heavily focused on hygiene, which was perceived as far superior to rural areas and the vet's postmortem exam also made them feel that the animal products and meat must be safe. And then lastly, many participants had prior experience with disease mitigation efforts and highlighted that slaughterhouse bans are indeed devastating for them. And then on the coast, in the last outbreak, they knew that Rift Valley fever was in the county, but wasn't really seen as an urban threat. So in conclusion, we've highlighted that urban risk is different than rural risk, so may require different public health messaging, and um, efforts to stop introduction. The high reliance on vets in connection with risk and safety means that we must give rural, give pardon, urban vets more tools and diagnostic support because the current focus on hygiene and the post-mortem exam is an opportunity for Rift Valley fever. So we're currently exploring how we may even leverage that gap and test milk and slaughtered animal blood for Rift Valley fever to improve early detection. So thank you so much for listening to my talk. Please contact me if you wanna hear more. Hi, I'm Axon Mwale, presenting the findings of an exploratory study which focused on community participation in zoonotic disease prioritization, a case study of Nguruman in Kenya. Evidence shows that people living in remote areas near protected areas have a high risk of contracting zoonotic diseases. These communities often have no capacity to detect, control, and manage disease outbreaks. Consequently, communities rely on external help, which has succeeded in some areas, but failed in others. Partly, this failure is due to lack of resources and ownership by local communities to sustain programs and lack of political support. This study aimed to understand how socioeconomic and political determinants shape community participation in zoonotic disease prioritization in Nguruman. Community participation was conceptualized by combining two perspectives of participation, that is participation as a means to an end and participation as a form of empowerment. This approach was adopted to provide a holistic understanding of community involvement in disease management. Taking an ethnographically informed qualitative approach, four key informant interviews and three focus group discussions were conducted in areas around Nguruman, an area located in Magadi, sub count of Kajedo County, southwest of Kenya. The sample consisted of 10 females and 11 men aged 18 years and above. The participants were drawn from Maasai pastoralist communities using purposive and snowball sampling. The interview and focus group data were analyzed thematically, informed by the notes from the observations uh, obtained. Analysis of this study is still ongoing. Results show that participation in disease prioritization is influenced by professional specialization or employment in relevant fields such as veterinary medicine. 
Local knowledge and understanding of zoonotic diseases is only considered during implementation of interventions by experts, despite the willingness of communities to contribute to disease prioritization. Further, although determinants such as gender, socioeconomic status, policy, and external aid influence involvement in local community activities, these do not influence participation in disease prioritization. This is because of a strong emphasis on professional training as a requirement to participate in disease prioritization. It was observed that interventions implemented have not adopted a transdisciplinary One Health approach embedding participatory methods. In conclusion, community participation in this area takes a means to an end perspective where members are used to implement interventions by experts. Local community members are not involved in disease prioritization by local decision makers and experts. This is despite their willingness to participate and their indigenous knowledge and experience in managing zoonotic diseases. As a result, community members feel that important aspects about local context and control strategies are not considered in many interventions as they are not given an opportunity to give feedback and input in what works to inform policy. A transdisciplinary One Health approach should be implemented embedding participatory methods throughout the process. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you very much to those of um, those people who pre-recorded flash talks, and we will return to the rest of those flash talks later. But we will um, move on now because we were a little bit late, um, so to allow our in-person speakers to present. So I'd now like to introduce you to Dr. Katie Hamilton, a, parasitolo a parasitologist um, working with the University of Liverpool and Ilry, who would like to talk to us today about antimicrobial resistance in slaughterhouses in Busia. Thank you, Katie. Thank you, Leon. So as Leon said, I would like to talk to you about a study that was performed by many of the people who are online and who are sitting in this room on antimicrobial resistance in a slaughterhouse in Western Kenya. Now, I know all of you in this room know how to define One Health, but what I would like to do is to add another aspect to it. I would like to introduce the food chain alongside the traditional humans, environment, domestic animals, and peri-domestic wildlife. So as you all are aware, antimicrobial resistance occurs when bacteria, viruses, fungi, and parasites evolve over time and no longer respond to medicines, making infections harder to treat and increasing the risk of disease spread, severe illness, and death. And during this study, we focused on E. coli as an exemplar emerging pathogen which exist in a diversity of hosts, in the environment, on the food, and in waste. It can be a harmless gut commensal. They can cause some pathogenic strains can cause life-threatening bloodstream infections and common illnesses, illnesses. E. coli can also cause diseases in animals, leading to severe economic losses due to mortality and morbidity. E. coli was categorized by the World Health Organization as a priority pathogen due to its widespread antibiotic resistance. Slaughterhouses are considered hotspots for pathogen and AMR transmission, given the frequent interactions between the people who work there, the animals, and the surrounding environment. This creates a risk both for the workers and for the people who consume the meat products. Therefore, slaughterhouses are optimal sentinel sites for surveillance and also given, and for intervention studies, given the ripple effect that they have on other sectors. The objective of our study was to conduct a microbiological assessment of the slaughterhouse's working environment and to engage in different stakeholders' discussions on AMR. The ultimate goal of the project was to obtain a baseline study of the AMR landscape within the slaughterhouse setting and to then use this information to develop relevant AMR educational material. So our study was part of a much larger study called Zoolink. And Zoolink went out to do a surveillance study for emerging zoonoses. And they had set up 12 sentinel sites within three counties within Western Kenya. Now, each of these sentinel sites had to have a livestock market, two or three slaughterhouses, and a hospital nearby. As you can see, we wanted to study slaughterhouses. And the top picture shows an informal slaughter slab. And the second one below shows a more organized, larger slaughterhouse. And these are the types of uh, slaughterhouses we were working with. 
So the microbiological assessment, we took biological samples from each slaughterhouse. We sampled the floor using the boot socks in the first picture. We sampled the equipment that was used in the slaughterhouse. We took swabs from the inside of a dress carcass and the outside of a dress carcass. We took some water that was used for washing. We asked the slaughterhouse workers if they would mind if we took a handprint. And we also sampled the meat box, which is where the carcass from the slaughterhouse gets carried and delivered to the butchers. During the same time, we also held stakeholder discussions. We first held a focus group discussion with the county veterinary office, officers, the sub-county veterinary officers, and the meat inspectors. And during these discussions, we explored stakeholders involved in antimicrobial resistance within the slaughterhouse context, factors driving the AMR, and the challenges dealing with AMR. We next organized a series of workshops for the slaughterhouse workers in the three counties. With them, we explored which drugs they commonly use, why they use them, and had they ever experienced treatment failure? And if so, why did they think this had happened? So now the results of the biological sample. We collected 193 samples from 13 slaughterhouses. Nine of those were ruminant and four of those were pig in 11 of the sentinel sites. We identified isolates in just over half of the samples. There really appeared to be no difference between the pig and the ruminant slaughterhouse samples. And the highest proportion of isolates in the samples came from the carcass, the boot sock, and the meat box. We took the, well, then we went on to do antimicrobial susceptibility testing on 98 of the isolates. 21 of those were from pig, and 77 of those were from ruminant. On average, the isolates were resistant to three of the 14 of antibiotics tested. The results indicated that the isolates were most, most commonly resistant to streptomycin, amphicillin, tetracycline, and trisulfur. Multiple drug resistance is when an isolate is resistant to three or more classes. And in this case, over 51% of the isolates tested were. Again, there was no significant difference between the isolates from the ruminant and the pig slaughterhouse samples. And the highest portion of multiple drug resistant isolates were again from the, meat, from the boot sock. Extended spectrum beta-lactamase are enzymes that confer resistance to most beta-lactam antibiotics, including penicillins and cephalosporins. We found this expressed in 16.3% of the isolates tested. The samples with the most ESBLs were the boot sock and also the meat box. Now the boot sock represents the environment within the slaughterhouse. So this is significant. I mean, some of these slaughterhouses, it gives an indication of what is going on within the slaughterhouse. But there was no difference between ruminant or pig. So it just appears as if there's one large soup just mixing around within the environment. Through the focus group discussions that we held, we identified the stakeholders that really play a role in antimicrobial resistance within the slaughterhouse setting and how they relate to each other. Now, butchers emerged as prominent stakeholders as they are often the ones who bring the animal to the slaughterhouse and then again take the, take the carcass to the butchers. Butchers emerged as one individuals who can exert a lot of pressure to the point where some individuals complained that they couldn't actually do their work properly due to the pressure that the butchers are putting on them. We believe that we can use the butchers influence and leverage it to positively influence and educate other stakeholders. The inadequate use of drugs was recognized as a reason for the increase in, in driving resistance. This included the under or overdosing of animals, not respecting, respecting withdrawal periods, and the indiscriminate prescription by professionals, such as medics and vets. And this was highlighted 
by one participant who said, if we vets also continue looking at all animals like they are antibiotic deficient, that is the disease we treat. This problem will continue to escalate. Major challenges in dealing with AMR within a slaughterhouse setting is related to the limited staff and the inadequate funding, which leads to underinvestment in the infrastructure and the equipment. Many of the individuals who work in the slaughterhouse, they don't have any protective clothing of any sort. There is limited availability of water, the perimeter fence, which is important for biosecurity is often missing and waste disposal is sometimes indiscriminate and in, to spread into the environment. When we queried what they thought, what the workers thought of AMR situation in the slaughterhouse, they said they had no idea as there was no laboratory capacity to detect or surveillance to detect any changes in AMR. Everyone did agree that the antimicrobial resistance requires a multi-sectorial approach involving many stakeholders. This can be very challenging to coordinate, but they did appreciate that the medics should be involved for public sensitization as they're the ones that carry so much respect within the community. A national action plan on prevention and containment of antimicrobial resistance was launched in 2017. The results and part of this um, national policy is to involve all stakeholders. The results from our stakeholder meeting indicated there needs to be a better coordination with the people who are trying to introduce the action plan to the people on the ground to ensure that there's a proper implementation and control of antimicrobial resistance. When we spoke to the slaughterhouse workers regarding drugs and what they take, they admitted quite freely that they often just use self-diagnosis and only go to hospital or seek medical advice if there is any case of complications. They admitted that they had experienced drug failure in humans, mostly anti-malarials, and in animals, ectoparasitic and helminthic drugs haven't worked. Drugs are freely available on the markets, in the streets, and in the small corner shops. That fact coupled with a lack of formal advice leads to an unquantifiable amount of use of antibiotics in animals and humans. One of the most popular antibiotics purchased for humans was amoxicillin and for animals was alamycin. When we queried the reasons for resistance, they often, the slaughterhouse workers, knew that there was a germ that causes disease and it is transmitted. They're also aware that they needed to take the drugs, but the reasons why they never finished the courses was lack of money, incorrect use, incorrect drug use, and fear of side effects. And also the fact that they were feeling better. So why do I bother finishing my course? As one individual said, Sometimes you visit the chemist or clinic where a dose is prescribed for you, but you don't have enough cash. So maybe the drugs cost like 600 and you have 200. So because the doctor wants money, they tell you to go with the little drug and ask after how many days will you get the money? You tell them tomorrow. You take the drugs for a few days and notice a change then stop, which also contributes because you have not finished the dose. We found that many people who worked in the slaughterhouse were aware that they were at a risk with the work that they do to disease transmission. As one slaughterhouse worker said, so maybe there are diseases that affect the animals and is undergoing treatment. The animal was taken to the slaughterhouse without completing the treatment. When slaughtering the animal, there is the interaction between human and the animal. In case there are injury to the human, there may be mixing of blood of the animal and human blood, and hence we can also be affected. Hygiene was an uh, area that those slaughterhouse workers were completely aware was, was, um, was 
important in dealing with resistance, both personal hygiene, for example, washing hands and clean clothes, and at the workplace. They recognize the importance of education in understanding and mitigating the risk, as can be seen by the quote on the slide. Educate us on how we would be handling maybe the meat before it reaches. Which other ways are we handling where? Educating us on getting a knife, cutting meat, how to hang the meat so that it doesn't get bacteria from the ground. Like you said, dust usually contains bacteria. So you educate us before undertaking the work. As part of the study, we developed an educational video that we produced and shared with all the participants taking part in the study. The video was so well received that the government of Kenya endorsed it by including their coat of arms at the end of the video. Public health messages are important and our work we are doing here directly informs the implementation of the national strategy. I would just like to say thank you very much to Eureka for organizing this and allowing me to highlight my work and all the people who are involved in the study and everyone who funded this. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Katie. Um, so I would um, firstly like to thank you for that great presentation, um, but secondly, put you on the spot a little like I did to, um, to George earlier and just ask you um, about some of your experiences working in a multidisciplinary team um, and anything that you would like to um, tell the participants about how best to sort of undertake One Health research. I think with our One Health research, because as I said at the very beginning, it incorporated the food systems as well. So I've added another factor to it. I think that we were very lucky. Everyone was very keen and wanted to be, um, be involved, but there were key players who we missed out. And I think when you undergo research, do in a One Health situation, like we all should do, you have to do your groundwork and make sure that nobody's missed out. By that, I mean, we should have incorporated the butchers when we were doing our stakeholders meetings, but the key person didn't, wasn't highlighted as an, an individual of prominence until we started discussing. So it's slowly, slowly build, build, build. So I think that's, does that answer your question? That's great. So there was a sort of iterative nature in building your sort of research question and the people you were um, yes. working with. That's great. Um, and thank you very much for highlighting the educational video. I would like to ask if you could put the link to that in the chat so that yes. everybody can easily access that. Um, that would be wonderful. Thank I will you do. so much. Okay, another round of applause for Katie. Thank you. Thank you. Now I would like to invite um, Dr. Michelle Katsudi to join us. Um, Michelle is a veterinarian at the University of Nairobi and was um, an intern here at ILRI in the Animal and Human Health Program and she would like to tell us today about her work in Nairobi. Thank you so much, Michelle. Thank you. Thank you, Leanne, um, for that introduction. So, yes, so my name is Michelle Kasudi and I will be presenting on work on a study that I did with Dishon Muloy and Eric Pav on integrating ecosystem and public health into urban planning, a case study of Nairobi City. So I'll begin with the definition of urbanization. This is the population shift from rural to urban areas. In other words, it is the process through which cities are formed. And here we can see, um, the numbers of urban population worldwide from the year 1980, um, which was 39%, and in 2015, it rose to 54%. And it is postulated that in 20, by 2050, the number will rise to 66%. And just where are these um, urban residents going to reside? Our research shows that one in three urban dwellers live in slums or informal settlements. 
as you can see in this image, it shows a wealthy neighborhood next to informal settlements. And we can see the disparity and inequality that directly affects the health of urban residents. So what can we use to measure the health of urban residents? These are some of the determinants that can be measured. We have physical housing, health services, food systems, air quality, among others. And after looking at these and doing an in-depth uh, research on urban, urban health, we discovered that there are gaps in urban health. And these include weak linkage between urban planning, urban health, and urban biodiversity. There is minimal interaction and coordinated effort among stakeholders. And then there are weak integrated surveillance systems to monitor and survey these determinants of health. And to, in an attempt to address these gaps, we decided to develop an interdisciplinary project on urban ecosystem health, um, incorporating urban planning, ecology, and human health. So we decided to use Nairobi as uh, the location for this study because it is an ideal depiction of a rapidly urbanizing city. 60% of its residents live in informal settlements and it has high infectious and non-communicable disease burden. In, on the, uh, in the image on the right, we can see an interesting relationship between a country's um, gross national product and the mortality caused by infectious disease and non-communicable disease. We can see that as the GNP increases, uh, mortality caused by non-communicable disease increases, while that caused by infectious disease decreases. We also have here um, an article from the conversation about how Nairobi is rapidly losing its green spaces, which could lead to increased disease incidence. So the approach that we used, um, we did a, an in-depth literature review on urban health and then I developed a theory of change which helped guide and map the work. Then the next step was to identify relevant stakeholders through internet searches, then contacting the stakeholders that was through emails and phone calls, and then um, have key informant interviews to generate data on the different systems. And in these interviews, we use the snowballing approach to identify other key partners. So 30 institutions were identified and 18 responded so far and 12 meetings have been done with representatives from each sector. We divided the four, we divided uh, the institutions into four categories. That is research institutions, urban planning, public health, ecosystem health. And as we can see in the graph, in the chart below there, that is how they were divided. The data analysis plan involved data collection, transcription of the meetings, a thematic analysis to draw out major themes from the interviews. And then since this is an ongoing work, we plan to generate and validate hypotheses with government planning authorities, and then test the, these hypotheses in the field and in the lab. So this is a theory, the theory of change that I came up with. It states the problem, which is lack of relationship between urban planning, ecosystem health, and public health. Then the main goal, which is to institutionalize operational linkage, not just uh, because we are aware that there are linkages that exist, but we want to make sure that they are operational. So our long-term goals include creating new and strengthening existing collaborations and partnerships amongst the stakeholders, empowering Kenyan researchers and planning authorities on the created collaborations, and also strengthening urban ecosystem surveillance systems, and ultimately contribute to sustainable human settlement planning. Our short-term goals, um, I'll just mention a few because of time, identification of stakeholders, which we already did, another like a stakeholder capacity building, which we plan to do, and setting up of surveillance systems. Uh, these are some of the assumptions that we have as we do the work. For example, that the partnerships that are formed will be sustainable, and that mm -hmm. um, the planning authorities and policymakers are willing to adapt research into their decisions. And then some of the indicators that we have 
um, the surveillance frameworks that are created and evidence of synergies between the stakeholders. So after doing a transcription and thematic analysis, these are some of the, the themes that uh, were emerging. We have weak coordination. 75% of the respondents stated that there are clear individual roles and existing partnerships between the urban health sectors, but there are ill-defined linkages between the sectors. One of the respondents stated that, and I quote, water is far from health, which uh, essentially means that they believe that water supply has no relation to health outcomes. Another theme was competing priorities. The respondents stated that their competing priorities that might be caused by um, sometimes in some cases, some stakeholders are given tokenistic roles in projects while others are given disproportionate influence on planning decisions. Then there's the theme of minimal operalization. Um, the respondents state that frameworks for urban development and policy exist, but there is poor implementation. This can be caused by, um, for example, changes in governance, which cause changes in priorities, and then it leads to a delay in implementation. There's also little accountability caused by um, these limited platforms to which, uh, through which the implementers can be held accountable for their inaction. And then funding, one of the respondents stated that they have a challenge with financing, which causes a delay in implementation. While another stated that um, stakeholders are too dependent on international organizations for external funding, instead of taking the initiative for urban development. Then we also have weak research policy interface. Most of the, the respondents agreed that research is incorporated into urban planning decisions, but there is also, that comes with weak implementation, which causes a challenge. There are also an integrated surveillance systems. So currently we only have three urban demographic surveillance systems in sub-Saharan Africa. One of them is in Ethiopia, the other in Burkina Faso, and we have one right here in Nairobi. The Nairobi urban demographic surveillance system has been operational for the last 18 years and is run in two slums in Nairobi. And it collects information on main demographic events, health and socioeconomic outcomes. Another concern was COVID-19, where the respondents were concerned about how we can sustain the responses to COVID, to other outbreaks, and how we can plan our cities for outbreak response. So this is just uh, another illustration of the different responses from the different sectors. On the y-axis, we have the respondents in percentage. On the x-axis, we have the different sectors and the bars represent the different themes. So we can see that weak coordination and research and cooperation was mentioned by uh, respondents from all the different sectors. And interestingly, the research sector did not mention a challenge with implementation. And then we can also see that only the research sector and the ecosystem health sectors um, have active urban surveillance systems. So our conclusions for this work is that there are weak linkages existing within the urban health sectors. There are challenges uh, with the implementation and operalization of policies and frameworks. And there is need to form new and strengthen existing urban health surveillance systems. Our recommendation would be to adopt a holistic approach to urban health and establish central coordination for the stakeholders, the different stakeholders, that is vets, um, ecologists and scientists and urban planners also um, to be on the same page and have clearer goals. Our main goals, as I mentioned in the theory of change are in line with the sustainable development goals. We have SDG 17 to promote implementation and partnership, SDG 11 to make cities, to make cities and human settlements inclusive, safe, resilient, and sustainable, and SDG3 to ensure healthy lives and 
uh, promotes well-being for all. So our future work involves having a series of meetings and workshops for further stakeholder engagement and also for capacity building. And through these meetings, we can have focus group discussions where we'll uh, generate and validate hypotheses. And then we'll hold a major stakeholder meeting where we can build a fundable research program. I'd like to acknowledge uh, the funders of this work, UKRI and GCRF, and everyone else who made this work possible and supported it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michelle. That was absolutely fascinating talk. Um, and I'm really sorry that due to our time constraints, most of your questions will be um, followed up in the chat, if that's OK. Um, but I'm sure I'd like to just ask direct one thing to you. I'm sure that's that you may have seen some missing stakeholders in our mentee session. So do you want to reflect on, uh, on the participants of this meeting and anyone you see are missing? Well, in relation to the work that I'm doing, I didn't notice any urban health, any from the, um, sorry, urban planning um, sector. So maybe you can incorporate them because we are um, trying to have um, a plan for sustainable future, sustainable urban planning for future health. So I think to include them in this one health approach would be important. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think this was the first time I had really considered this and it was a real eye opener. So thank you so much for, for your talk today. I'd like now to pass to Nicholas Bohr to take us through a brief mentee session um, before we finish our flash talks and um, have a break for lunch. Thank you. So thanks, Leon, and all the presenters for today. And we'd love to engage the audience now on Menti, having listened to, first of all, the welcoming talks and the different works that they're doing. So maybe you can switch gears to Menti to give you a chance to listen in and share your contribution. Yeah, so let's hear from the presentation that you've had today, some great examples that you've seen on One Health and Why. You can put in on Menti, they're coming in, MR, MR, <laughs> yeah. Also say why, why you saw them as great examples of One Health. Yeah, we see the integration of the slaughterhouse workers, which is good, always good to involve them. RVF also, in terms of vaccines for humans and animals, not only animals. Uh, yeah, we see more research coming in, RVF, AMR, yeah, AMR. I think we've not seen, we've not had a lot, but we'll hear a lot of talks as we move along. And then we are at 67 now, 68. I hope people have not logged out for lunch. Yeah, AMR. Let's go to the next one. Yeah, what are some of the aspects of One Health that you saw that were missing, especially now that we mentioned that One Health is collaborative in nature? Oh, gender, good, good. And we'll be talking about gender in tomorrow's session, gender in One Health. Yeah, some, some are saying it was well incorporated. Good work, <laughs> Katie and Michelle. Climate change, environment uh, has been superficially mentioned. One Health in Abata is a good example. Epidemiological modeling, social economic status here. We saw that AMR can be a driver when people don't have a lot of cash. Breaking professional barriers, very important. All right, so thanks so much. We'll still have more chances as, as, we, as we move on with the conference. Hello and welcome to my presentation. I'd like to share with you some of the findings we have with regards to antimicrobial use among pastoral communities in Kenya. As a background, we understand that antimicrobial resistance is a serious public health problem both locally and globally. A lot of research has already been conducted uh, on, on antimicrobial use, especially in large-scale production systems and in developed countries with minimal research done in lo uh, low and middle income countries, especially in pastoral production systems. And so we undertook this study to uh, understand how these communities make decisions on antimicrobial use, given uh, the fact that pastoralists actually contribute a major component on our, our beef uh, production value chain especially here in Kenya, this presents a good opportunity for any intervention that would need to be done to mitigate antimicrobial um, resistance in the food uh, value chain. 
Uh, we sought to understand what factors influence the decisions that are made with whether a herd is treated with antimicrobials or not. And we collected data using a community-based animal health survey that included um, herd health uh, practices, uh, vet services access, and uh, vet advice um, access as well, as well as other herd health management practices in this um, household next to the Masai Mara National Reserve. And this was a very fertile um, study site for human wildlife in interface and um, livestock wildlife interface, again, presenting a very good One Health uh, study area. We are subset um, factors into six uh, thematic areas, as you can see depicted here, and all of these were to help us identify antimicrobial use trends on different herds. And to understand antimicrobial use in the different herds, we then uh, defined our outcome as AMU in uh, different species, that was cattle and sheep and goats separately, and also used uh, disease-based models, which were uh, FMD and OFF models. We then ran a multimodal logistic regression, which is a supervised machine learning approach to identify factors that uh, popped up as highly ranked in the different models. And as you can see, there are factors that in all the four models uh, came up as important factors in antimicrobial use trends in this community. In a nutshell, we identified the gender education uh, of the respondent, occurrence of CBPP uh, and tick-borne diseases, as well as use of some vaccines and access to vet services and advice uh, are critical components when it comes to decisions of antimicrobial use uh, among different herds in these communities. Thank you, and I'm happy to take any questions. Hello and welcome to this presentation. My name is James Sakoko. The title of my presentation is Molecular Epidemiology of Brucella Species in Mixed Livestock Human Ecosystems in Kenya and Tanzania. Brucella species cause infection in animals and humans and results into socioeconomic losses. Several studies have reported the presence of Brucella antibodies in Kenya and Tanzania, but information on circulating species of Brucella within the region still remains insufficient. Therefore, we collect a total of 1,571 samples from cattle, sheep, goats, camels, pigs, and humans uh, from Marsabit and uh, Narok counties in Kenya, as well as northern Tanzania. We extracted DNA from these samples and tested the DNA for the presence of the genus Brucella, as well as um, Brucella botus and Brucella militensis using real-time PCR technique. Our results shows that Brucella abortus and Brucella militensis are circulating in human population as well as uh, all the livestock species except pigs that only tested positive for Brucella abortus. The distribution of Brucella species varied across the different regions, with northern Tanzania and Narok having a higher proportion of Brucella militensis as opposed to Brucella abortus while Master Beach region had a higher proportion of Brucella abortus. We did not find any significant association between Brucella abortus and uh, sheep and goats, while Brucella militensis didn't have any significant association with, Bruce, uh, with cattle. We found significant association between occurrence of abortion and the presence of Brucella abortus while Brucella militensis was associated with retained placenta in animals. Um, people within the age category between 21 and 40 had an elevated um, positivity rate. This is mainly due to, due to their increased role in taking care of animals. So in summary, we found uh, zoonotic species of Brucella circulating in the different animal species, suggesting that all these animals could be playing a role in transmitting Brucella to humans. Therefore, we recommend a multidisciplinary approach that targets all the different livestock species to help in creating public awareness and contribute to the reduction of the existing risks such as, such, risks, such as um, improper handling and disposal of aborted materials, retained placenta, uh, drinking of raw milk, um, as well as mixing herds that could perpetuate the transmission of brucella within the population. Otherwise, if nothing is done, then we still have continued transmission of Brucella uh, that results into socio-economic losses. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, good morning, viewers, and uh, welcome to this presentation. 
I'm presenting on a variation of sanitation-based intervention strategy for prevalence of poor sensitive psychosis in Busia County 2021. My name is Bernard Chege. For the introduction part, you will find that smallholder fig path farming is a very important activity in the rural areas of Kenya. And uh, because it's relatively cheap to raise these pigs, and also it requires very low capital, and also they uh, multiply very quickly and attaining market rate very fast. But uh, processes psychosis has been a growing public health problem in the areas where pigs are farmed. And uh, there is very high prevalence in Kenya that has been reported, especially in the Western region, uh, to a level of 37.6% uh, uh, by AG RISA. And the risk factors are known uh, from previous studies that have been conducted, which includes open defecation, eating at a cook pox, and free roaming pigs. And Busia County was declared open free defecation in 2016. And was, through this study, we want to look at the effect of, um, of, of improved sanitation after this county was declared open free defecation. And, uh, this research uh, uh, is, is asking ourselves some questions uh, whether this one improved the uh, prevalence of, uh, of, 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 of sensitive causes. So we want to check uh, whether these total then uh, the, the national total sanitation program had an effect on prevalence of sensitive psychosis. This study we conducted in Busia, um, as you can see, uh, this is a study site. The data collection we did a cross section study as a post implementation uh, study. Then we had data abstraction uh, from uh, some study that was done in 2012, that is before implementation of this sanitation uh, program. And we did a most state the results that we have, we found that there is a, a, a great improvement uh, in the coverage of uh, treat facilities and uh, also the usage of treat facilities has really improved in this year. But the prevalence, the prevalence has really uh, reduced uh, from a prevalence of uh, 9.7 to a prevalence of 3.8% by lingual palpation, but also looking at, uh, at, at uh, AG ELISA, it has also reduced significantly. 0.54 and uh, looking at the factors that uh, could be responsible um, for this we found that uh, uh, after that deduction of uh, improvement in sanitation we had uh, reduced uh, prevalence uh, in, and therefore uh, this significant uh, uh, reduction in prevalence may have come because of improved sanitation in the area and uh, we are thinking that uh, still uh, this prevalence of sister uh, causes uh, in Busia County However, this prevalence is very low, and uh, the only factor that has uh, significantly reduced is, um, is improved sanitation in terms of toilet cambalage and also the usage of the toilet, which means this could be the factor that is responsible for the great reduction in uh, some of the recommendations we have is that uh, we need to keep maintaining this uh, toilet to improve and improving this sanitation because it has an impact on the percentage of courses and pray more stuff and the sensitized farmers on the uh, prever on person psychosis then mass drug administ administration is schools to control the problem and further studies especially to look at uh, the prevalence of tenuous and also uh, epilepsy those are the acknowledgements my name is titus motueri and thank you for inviting me to share my work uh, through this uh, flash talk in this conference my work was on distribution and genetic diversity of cystic echinococcosis in a non-endemic region, and that is Western Kenya, a one health approach. And cystic echinococcosis is a disease that causes significant public health problems in areas where there is an uncontrolled slaughter or in places where livestock uh, keeping is extensive. And this disease has not been previously reported in Western Kenya but there has been continued and increased movement of livestock from areas of high disease density to regions of low disease density. And this has amplified the risk of its introduction to a non-endemic region. We have found many cysts in slaughtered livestock. We have conducted molecular analysis in these cysts and confirmed all of them to belong to Echinococcus granulosa sensus tripto, which is the sheep strain of the parasite, but now found in different other uh, species uh, and ghetto in our case. Through sequencing, we report 11 haplotypes of NAD1 gene and 19 haplotypes of COX1 gene. And uh, some of these haplotypes are novel and have not been previously reported elsewhere. 
This has shown an expression of intraspecies variation by genetic drift or selective response, and we are following up to see the effect of these genetic changes. We surveyed dogs in Busia and we surveyed dogs in the Bungoma counties and found one dog with a super infection of Echinococcus granulosa centimia species, which was confirmed uh, uh, through a PCR restriction fragment length polymorphism. And on the human component of the study, our human screening survey uh, uh, that involved 1,002 participants identified seven patients with presumptive cystic lesions uh, recommended for follow up according to the World Health Organization. Uh, classification and recommendation. We find that cystic echinococcosis is transported by routes of animal trend to Western Kenya, and that dogs pick up the parasite from poorly condemned offal. Human evidence is not currently definitive because this is a slow disease. However, if the risk and practices continue, then human infections may be realized and confirmed soon. There is a need for controlled life. Unfortunately, it seems that Titus has got cut off. What a shame. Um, I would love to hear the end of uh, Titus's talk. Um, but thank you, everybody, for your participation this morning. Those of you in person here in Nairobi, I'd like to invite you to come for lunch. Um, and for those of you online, please um, uh, have a, a break and come back fully refreshed. We start again at um, 1400 hours um, East African time, and we look forward to seeing you um, at that point. Thank you. Bye. All right. Good afternoon. Um, welcome to the afternoon session. My name is Tumbi Mwangi. I am a professor of epidemiology at the University of uh, Nairobi and Washington State University. Um, and this afternoon, we have got lined up really nice presentations. Uh, we'll begin with one by a good friend of mine, uh, Bernard Gwanda, Dr. Bernard Gwanda from uh, National Museums of Kenya. Uh, he has nearly 20 years of uh, working in National Museums of Kenya, 19 years to be exact. And today he's speaking to us on the Crimean Congo hemorrhag uh, hemorrhagic fever, virus in humans, animals and ticks in Kenya. Please, welcome. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. I think I'm privileged to talk to you when you have a little bit of more energy. In the name of Sugar After Lunch, I uh, will make this presentation very brief. Uh, thanks, Dr. Thumbi, for inviting me. <clears throat> uh, this work I'm going to present is, uh, the portion I'm presenting is uh, a small bit, bit of it. We're interested in tracking Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever virus in Kenya in all possible places we can get it, animals in the wild, animals at home, as well as human beings. <clears throat> right, uh, what I'm going to present is a quick screen on based on serology. Uh, we're taking on um, cattle and buffalo. This work is a collaborative work between National Museums of Kenya, Kenya Wildlife Service, Kenya Wildlife Research and, and Training Institute, University of Umea in Sweden, and now we are getting new collaborators from uh, Spain. <clears throat> I need to repeat this, that we are I'm presenting a serological data, but in the background, we are analyzing the, we are conducting PCR to see whether we can have confirmation from all the sample sets we have. We are also combining samples that we have collected over the years, plus freshly collected samples in the wild. I will just call it uh, Crimean Congo virus, but uh, the extended name is uh, Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever virus. That is the actual name, but for ease of communication, I'll just shorten it to Crimean Congo virus. And I hope uh, you'll be able to catch me on that. <clears throat> well, it's not very new because the first uh, detection and discovery was the way back in 1936, but it has a sporadic outbreaks and it has potential to cause hormonal infections in hospitals and case fatality rate is very high, ranging from 10 to 50%. Uh, if, if this is um, moderated, probably you'll get an average of 30. So it's, it's as, as little as uh, many of the hemorrhagic fever viruses, which are sporadically 
reoccur in the continent of Africa. <clears throat> Previous reports in the, in the country, in Kenya, include a PCR confirmation of a fatal case in Western Kenya way back in 2000. But the several studies in Kenya that have documented, that have conducted cell prevalence, both in human beings and uh, wildlife, as well as uh, in ticks. Um, despite all these studies from way back to 1936, hemorrhagic fever is not well explained in terms of how prevalent it is uh, within livestock, wildlife, and even human beings. Even though this caution that was provided by the Ministry of Health that uh, doctors need to be aware when they admit patients that, uh, that, that show tendencies of hemorrhage because it can set off to be an outbreak within the hospital and it would be difficult to get rid of. And with that high case fatality rate of 40, you can be sure even patients that could be saved could go down with this virus. <clears throat> In this study, we aimed at conducting the seroprevalence in management system that we thought could uh, influence persistent circulation as well as outbreak in, in human beings. So we looked at areas where wildlife are the main land use system like Nakuru National Park and uh, livestock are excluded. Human beings only go there as visitors or managers. As well as closed system with a bit of livestock and completely livestock go in and out like Masai Mara. And this is what we got. Um, I have some acronyms there which I'll explain. The bar chart on, your, on, the, on the left is a bit exaggerated because the samples were collected over eight years. So we don't pay too much close attention to it. We have to, I'm throwing caution in interpreting it. But the LNNP is the Lake Nakuru, which is closed. There is no livestock going in there. And we found very high sort of prevalence rate of Kimian Congo among the buffaloes. In all Pajeta, which is um, a conservancy enclosed, they have livestock as well as um, wildlife. We found that uh, the sort of prevalence of uh, Crimean Congo among livestock was moderate, but buffaloes very low. In Masai Mara, the sort of prevalence moderate, you can call it moderate when we look at just the, the, the cattle. But when you look at the buffaloes, it was lower. I'll give you the actual figures here um, and I'll probably explain in my next three slides. We looked at buffaloes on their own and we looked at cattle on their own first and then we com made a comparison. And we saw that um, where there are no livestock, so the prevalence of Crimean Congo among buffaloes, very, very high. Where we have, li or where, where we have uh, cattle mixing with the buffaloes, the figure comes down significantly, but among the cattle, it shoots high, whether it is in a closed or a semi-closed. Closed here means closed for, for livestock and human beings. In Laikipia, where Alpajeta is, we did a small experiment. So, so one-off sampling of cattle outside the conservancy among the communities. And we found that the percentage of those tested uh, positive or show, showing exposure were low among the, the cattle. Mm -hmm. And of course, outside, uh, we didn't uh, get any buffaloes to, to sample and compare. So in conclusion, we found that uh, the exposure of uh, cattle and livestock in all the management systems is high, particularly areas where livestock, like in Masai Mara, where livestock go into the park, come out, and different uh, farm, uh, livestock keepers mix. This is different from where we have got one management system managing both livestock and wildlife in Old Pajeta, like Old Pajeta. In Old Pajeta, the, the conservancy is fenced off and 
the herds of cattle within the property remain constant. They don't mix with those that are, found, that are outside the conservancy area. The buffaloes or wildlife in general mix very freely with the livestock. And we think the vector that uh, the vector community that bites both livestock and wildlife are the same. The effect of land use system of keeping wildlife together with livestock helps to maintain Crimean Congo. And this is by sure of zero prevalence, which is a measure of uh, exposure. Uh, unfortunately, this conference has come too soon before I could get the PCR data. But of course, this is an indication that uh, Crimean Congo virus is circulating and maintained within both livestock and wildlife. We also do not have, I don't, I don't have yet the data for human beings, the livestock handlers within the areas where we sampled. So we don't know what the picture will be, but for sure there is clear risks of transmission between livestock and wildlife, as well as human being, particularly those that are handling. A previous study in Wajia in 2013 showed that uh, people who handle camels, goat, sheep, but to a less extent cattle are exposed. The sort of prevalence was as high as 40% in some cases in Wajia, but this was way back in 2013, which is nearly a decade. We like to see this kind of uh, study in Masai Mara where some cattle keepers come from very far and go into the wildlife area, graze and leave. Whether they pick and drop the virus, we are not sure, but I think that will become clear, which are some of the gaps that our study is addressing in the next steps. We think the elevated um, exposure rates of buffalo in Lake Nakuru National Park is a unique event because the buffaloes don't mix with the livestock in the park. Well, whereas the, the risk of transmitting it to human beings is very, is very low, except for those who are going for picnics who disembark from their vehicles and probably take a walk in the park and therefore get exposed to the ticks. We think that's very low. But the high prevalence rate of 90% of exposure in Lake Nakuru requires more investigation to see whether that exposure shows actual um, outbreak among the buffaloes or it was just historical exposure. Probably a point to note as I wind up is that um, among the cattle, we found that younger, those that are two years and uh, lower were less exposed to the virus than the adult cows. The difference was as high as 50%. Because of time, I think I would like to just thank all those who supported us, particularly the Swedish Council for Research that are supporting the four institutions to collaborate, develop capacity to conduct research on neglected hemorrhagic fever pathogens that are potential to spread from human beings, from, from wildlife to livestock and human beings. I particularly thank also my colleagues from my university, Kenya Wildlife Service. And of course, I thank the organizers for bringing me in here. I uh, hope we could meet again when I have human and uh, other wildlife data, which we are currently analyzing. I hope I've made it in good time. Yes, actually, you have a few minutes that we can ask a few or one or two questions. So many thanks for your presentation, Bernard. Um, I, di I did know though, like part of your slideshow, the zero prevalence among the wildlife that are in closed systems appear to be much higher than where you've got livestock. Did I get it right or wrong? I'm again? Did I get it right that have a higher zero prevalence in areas that have only wildlife uh, compared to where you have cattle and uh, what would be the reason for that? Are cattle serving as a, as a dilution factor for, for zero prevalence or what? Yeah, uh, that was my ending point, that uh, the elevated high exposure rate of Crimean Congo among the buffaloes, I've just showed the data on buffaloes, is uniquely high. Sorry, and I think uh, you could be right that we can impute the theory of dilution effect that uh, livestock would dilute 
<laughs> the, 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 the extremities of exposure. But we have to throw caution because this is exposure we're measuring. Once we get the PCR data, we will want to know the active, the active infections because um, exposure shows that uh, probably, and we were looking at uh, um, a case where some of our samples were collected way back in 2016 and others were collected in 2019. So we have to throw caution in interpreting the data, but it's true that could be cattle could be doing what we call the elution effect. So or maybe you just sampled older buffaloes. <laughs> That's also possible. One other question, uh, ticks. Um, I know the title indicates also, you know, infection in ticks, but I didn't see any data on that. Is that something you should be expecting? Sure, yeah. Uh, I was supposed to give you data also on ticks and um, on hyaloma ticks, but the data is not complete. <laughs> so I didn't want to have cook the, the, this honorable meeting with the tick data. Tick and human data is, um, is still in the kitchen. All right, uh, there might be maybe one question from the audience. Um, thank you so much, um, Bernard. We have a, a question from the um, participants online. Um, Annie McLeod um, congratulated you for a very interesting presentation and asks, do you have any information on how ticks are managed by livestock owning, com owning communities in your study areas, particularly the Masai Mara? Thank you. Yeah, we, we never conducted the household uh, interviews on how ticks are uh, managed among the farmers. But we know for sure that um, different farmers have different ways of managing ticks. Some of them would go for, co for commercialized services or people who come and spray. And uh, some pay little attention to this. And this, this, this mix of uh, some are attending to ticks, some don't attend to ticks, is part of the reason why we think uh, in Masai Mara, the prevalence among cattle was a little bit higher compared to old vegeta, where they don't mix. The, the herds of cattle are kept in an enclosed, enclosed uh, property and they don't mix with the communities who do not necessarily control ticks. So ticks are being controlled in different ways. And in Masai Mara particularly, each farmer would have different uh, intensity of, of management of ticks. All right, uh, well, I'm sure there'll be other questions on chat, so feel free to keep happy. answering them. I'll yeah. be happy to respond to them. Many thanks, Bernard. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Okay, so the next talk is from Dr. Dorian Bram, who is a PhD candidate at the University of Cambridge, uh, researching on uh, zoonosis within displaced populations. Uh, Dr. Bram is not here with us, but I think she has pre-recorded uh, her talk, so um, we should just get it in a minute. My name is Doreen Bram, and I am a PhD candidate at the C Disease Dynamics Unit at the Department of Veterinary Medicine at the University of Cambridge and Director of Praxis Labs, a research consultancy in humanitarian and international development. In this lecture, I will discuss the linkages between some of the most important challenges of the 21st century, including forced migration, food security, and infectious diseases, looking at the use of a framework based on the One Health approach to investigate zoonotic disease risk in displaced populations. Using a conservative estimate, over 60% of emerging infectious diseases are of zoonotic origin. However, of more importance to the health and daily lives of livestock dependent populations are endemic zoonoses such as brucellosis and bovine tuberculosis. During emergencies, the aftermath of conflict and disasters exacerbates ill health outcomes, while displacement further affects risks due to changing pathogens and disease factor environments, challenging living conditions and access to healthcare. This may be as a result of their location, which is quite often a remote marginal location assigned by local authorities, not in use by local populations, or a fear of prosecution by immigration authorities, for instance. Currently, there are over 82 million people forcibly displaced worldwide as a result of conflict, violence or disasters, almost 8 million more than when this map was made. The majority of forced migrants are internally displaced, the green sections of the pie chart on the map. Most displacement occurs in countries where a relatively large population is dependent on agriculture and livestock. In the context of climate change, environmental degradation and more frequent disasters, forced migration is projected to further increase with significant global health risk. 
However, although forced migration is often cited as a distinct risk factor, especially for the spread of infectious diseases between regions, this fails to capture the complex processes around movements, mixed populations and their networks, which all affect their vulnerability. However, currently there are few robust studies on zoonotic disease transmission risks in displaced populations. Most importantly, there is a lack of primary data with most st stakeholders assuming that the risk always increases due to the aforementioned risk factors without properly addressing these. Instead, animals are often blocked from formal relief camps due to the assumed zoonotic disease risk or only included in humanitarian responses as an afterthought, with the human population becoming solely dependent on humanitarian assistance such as food aid. Systematically ignoring the humanitarian responses, displaced people take matters into their own hands, using scarce resources to provide feed and improvised shelter for their livestock, as these pictures from Somalia show. While humans and animals lacking sufficient nutrition in substandard living conditions are likely to increase the risk of zoonotic disease transmission, the aim of my study is to determine the actual impact of displacement on zoonotic disease transmission vulnerability and risk. Based on systematic literature reviews into infectious and zoonotic disease risk factors during displacement and into the theoretical frameworks and approaches used to study zoonosis in displacement, I developed a conceptual framework combining concepts from eco-health, one health and social epidemiology as the basis for my fieldwork. I found that the eco-social theory provided a suitable background to analyze my research findings as it takes into account not only biological and environmental factors, but importantly includes political and economic processes and socio-economic inequalities and how these express themselves in health outcomes, which is highly relevant and often structurally marginalized displaced populations. I adopted a qualitative case study methodology approach using a combination of literature and secondary data reviews, conducting key informant interviews with experts in health, veterinary and disaster responses, and household level interviews with livestock dependent populations with displacement experience. For my study locations, I traveled to Pakistan and Jordan. In Pakistan, I conducted fieldwork in Sindh province, located in Southeast Pakistan, host to the river Indus Delta and the Tar Desert, bordering the Arabian Sea and India, at high risk of a range of environmental disasters and related displacement. In Jordan, I visited Mavra Governorate in northern Jordan, host to a large percentage of Syrian refugees with rural background. Each year, thousands of people become internally displaced in Sindh as a result of recurring droughts and floods, with livestock often the only movable assets. Sindh is vulnerable to flooding, not only from the river, but also during heavy monsoons, and as a result of the increasing impact of climate change, causing sea intrusion and coastal erosion. These causes result in either short or long-term displacement, with most relocating temporarily to nearby riverbanks, rebuilding their houses and shelters every year once the floods have retreated. If the floods are particularly severe, people and animals may move further away to urban areas to join relatives and host communities. During the so-called super floods of 2010, around 10% of displaced ended up in formal relief camps, where long livestock was allowed. Some of the people affected by the super flood remain displaced, primarily those who lost all their assets. During floods, formal and informal refugee camps or tent settlements are often assigned marginal locations in areas where local populations are unlikely to settle. Insufficient humanitarian funding to large crises have resulted in substandard living conditions and sanitary problems. Standing water is a prime infectious disease risk and land affected by seawater intrusion became salinated and unsuitable to establish sustainable livelihoods. Washing is done in the same canals as where the animals drink and bathe, while the lack of drainage is a concern for dengue and malaria. Displaced communities lived in makeshift shelters, with animals herded away from the living spaces during the day, but tied up next to it at night. Young animals were kept in the tents in the shade, in the same space where women cooked. Environmental conditions mean that shelters are destroyed annually and are in constant need of renovation. Young animals are kept close to cooking facilities and water storage, risking contamination. During displacement, livestock is an important consideration in determining movement and destination location, however rarely accommodated by relief agencies. Pre-existing connections, status within the community, role within the household and available resources played a significant role in determining displacement experience and related impact on immunity and health of animals and humans, both during displacement and the aftermath. Health outcomes during forced migration were mainly influenced by poor living conditions and a lack of nutrition and having to relocate to dry marginal zones. Meanwhile, people continuously have to spend time rebuilding shelters and livelihoods, impacted their availability to work and provided income, depend deepening the socio-economic divide and making them even more vulnerable to future disaster and disease, causing more temporary and permanent displacement. 
While environments and pathogens play a role, unequal power relations, pre-existing networks and connections, and the availability of assistance, all rooted in institutionalized historical inequalities, determine people's vulnerability to displacement and disease. One of the most important risk factors for zoonotic disease vulnerability is a person's socioeconomic status. And floods primarily affected the poor population as they lived in already low-lying marginalized areas appointed by feudal landlords. They were most at risk of displacement, have fewer access to resources, and therefore cannot pay veterinarians or doctors during health emergencies. Many do not own identification cards and are not registered anywhere, which hampers their access to healthcare, patchy even in normal times in rural Sindh. As livestock was not allowed in former relief camps, households split up. While women and children remained in camps, men would herd their animals in higher areas with no access to feed and water, where they encountered pathogens that were new to their animals. The lack of humanitarian assistance to livestock resulted in animal deaths through starvation and disease, impacting the food supply to the displaced, as well as their ability to recover livelihoods after the floods. Displacement experienced therefore primarily dependent on people's status within the community and pre-existing connections. My second case study location, Jordan, hosts over 1 million refugees from Syria and smaller populations from Iraq and other countries. Most refugees arrived in Jordan after the outbreak of civil war in Syria in 2011, during which the Syrian government lost control over large parts of the country, escalating in a complex multi-sided conflict over the next years. With the collapse of health services and vaccinations, diseases such as polio re-emerged. As a result of the lapse in quarantine and border control in Syria, the region saw an increase in endemic diseases, including brucellosis and leishmaniasis. However, outbreaks are generally blamed on illegal trafficking of animals by opportunistic traders rather than refugees bringing their livestock. Over half of the country's citizens have become forcibly displaced, with about half of those becoming refugees, and the vast majority hosted in neighboring countries, Turkey, Lebanon and Jordan, as many had pre-existing networks and connections. Access to veterinary and public health care for Syrians in Jordan is complex and has changed several times over the years, making it difficult to understand and access for refugees. And access and resulting health status of both animals and humans was highly dependent on pre-existing connections in local networks. Many Syrians already had relatives living in Jordan, since the borders were drawn artificially by colonial powers across tribal areas. Others had seasonal jobs for which they moved in and out of Jordan, staying behind permanently once the war broke out, often bringing their families living in informal tented settlements with newly acquired livestock, pictured here. Only a small group without pre-existing connections or sponsors is still living in formal refugee camps, of which Zaatari remains the largest and best known. Pathways to displacement impact people's living and health conditions, including through their living conditions and environment, access to veterinary and health services, and support from formal or informal connections. Humanitarian aid has scaled down over the years, while refugees still cannot formally access veterinary services, including vaccinations, and these policies of exclusion do not only threaten their and their animals' health status, but also that of the Jordanian host population. While environment and pathogens play a role in zoonotic disease risk in forced migration, it is mainly the compound hazards during displacement which determine zoonotic disease risks. These include power and poverty, pre-existing networks and connections, and the availability of assistance. People's vulnerability to zoonosis is largely grounded in structural inequalities, and related vulnerabilities need to be addressed at individual, household, community, and institutional level. During displacement, livestock is an important consideration in determining movement and destination location, however rarely accommodated by relief agencies. Pre-existing connections, status within the community, the role within the household, and available resources played a significant role in determining displacement experience and a related impact on immunity and health. Pathways to zoonotic diseases are therefore complex and non-linear, and responses to disease risks need not only consider biological drivers, but importantly environmental, historical, political, and socioeconomic factors. The results of my study highlight that health and disease outcomes in forced migration and complex emergencies do not only depend on prevalent diseases, but importantly on the type of displacement and people's status and socioeconomic profile. Researchers and responders can mitigate many of these risks by planning the response better, for instance setting up camps in safe spaces, accommodating animals, preventing overcrowding and ensuring sanitary living conditions, as well as access to veterinary services. Rather than blocking livestock and their owners access to humanitarian assistance, a better consideration of livestock value in terms of nutrition, but also mental health and recovery needs to be made. Great. Um, unfortunately, we do, have, we do not have uh, Dr. Bram with us uh, to answer any questions, but the work she has presented, I think is really interesting, particularly even for this region where you've got a lot of displaced populations. 
um, and particularly the circumstances surrounding, you know, where people live is not just environmental, but could also be social political uh, um, experiences, which could increase risk and the like. So I do think that's a really important uh, presentation to have been part of this and, and hopefully we can digest uh, it a bit further. Uh, for now, I would like us to focus on a few flash talks, um, which are ranging from antimicrobial resistance to with very fever and genomic surveillance. Um, so please pay attention. Thanks. Histoplasmosis, caused by the fungal species Histoplasma capsulatum, is a neglected tropical disease with a widespread global distribution. Histoplasma exists in the environment in a saprophytic mycelial form, but following host inoculation undergoes a temperature-induced morphological transition to its pathogenic yeast form. Subsequent disease progression and dissemination is associated with host immunocompetence. Why is histoplasma important? In Kenya, despite recognition of histoplasmosis as a disease of national public health concern, the prevalence of histoplasma exposure in the general population and in variable community environments remains unknown. How did we address the paucity of research? This study examines the human seroprevalence of antihistoplasma antibody and associations between seropositivity and demographic and environmental variables in rural Busia County, Western Kenya. Metadata and serum samples originated from a cross-sectional household survey previously conducted by the People, Animals and Their Zoonoses project under an ULRI program. A latex agglutination test was performed on 670 serum samples representing 178 households within 18 sublocations. Potential risk factors associated with histoplasma exposure were explored using multi-level logistic regression analysis. What were our research findings? A seroprevalence of 15.5% was measured. A multivariable logistic regression model was constructed which identified a statistically significant association between seropositivity and respondents reporting observation of rats within the household. The model identified two interaction terms associated with seropositivity. The first, reporting buildings constructed with mud walls and bats observed around the home, and also buildings constructed with mud walls and spring water collected as a water source. There was no evidence of associations due to clustering of seropositive samples at household nor sublocation level. What did we conclude? The seroprevalence results provide a baseline for sample size approximations for future epidemiologic studies of the burden of histoplasmosis in this region. The model identifies plausible risk factors for histoplasma capsulatum exposure in Busia County that warrant further investigation. Future research should examine the associations identified here and consider how health, demographic and socioeconomic factors impact on histoplasma transmission at the human-animal environment interface. Thank you for listening. Uh, so, hi, my name is Rachel. I'm going to present something small about the impact of aflatoxin on your cognitive and your developmental outcomes among children aged 2 to 6 years. This was a professional study done within the Lantino project that was being carried out by people from CDC as well as Washington State University. So a bit of background is that there is evidence that aflatoxin exposure in based neurodevelopment and cognitive outcomes. However, the relationship of these outcomes to humans is not very clear. There are differences in exposure in humans. Um, compared to animals, and the study authors note that these differences provide some uncertainty about the extension of animal data to humans, but some publications show that animal responses are relevant to humans, at least in broad terms. So given that probable multifaceted impact of aflatoxin or cognitive and neurological functions, it is important to clearly understand which functions are affected. So this was the methodology. Um, so we measured the cognitive outcomes using a, a tool called computerized bat battery for neuropsychological evaluation of children, or in other terms, BENSI. Then measured the neurodevelopmental outcomes using the Malawi Developmental Assessment Test. In other words, it's called uh, MDAT. So 
So with regards possible to aflatoxin to age, we find there is a significant association between aflatoxin and age, and it seems the mean aflatoxin exposure tends to increase across the years from age 2, 3, 4, 5, then the mean decreases at age, age 6. Uh, so it's really good to note that down. So when you look at the new environmental outcomes, uh, that is gross motor, social skills, language, and fine motor, and also you have the total scores. Again, it's aflatoxin. We see like there are several significant uh, values uh, that associate significant associations between your environmental outcomes and aflatoxin. So we are going to check in a multivariate analysis whether this remains significant. Also, when you look at the cognitive outcomes, cognitive outcomes, we see that there is no significant association between any of the cognitive outcomes and aflatoxin exposure. So, in animal studies, we have a, a, significant, a significant association between memory, visual motor coordination, process speed, and aflatoxin, but this seems not to be the case when it comes to humans. So, this is a multivariate uh, multivariate analysis. So, it shows that. Uh, there still remains significant association between some of the neurodevelopmental outcomes, such as the total developmental outcomes, as well as uh, language skills and fine motor skills. And with this, we come to the, that aflatoxin exposure was significantly associated with lower neurodevelopmental indicators in this cohort. So, assessing for neurodevelopmental outcomes should continue while integrating aflatoxin mitigation strategies as an additional means to monitor health impacts and exposure. Uh, thank you for listening. I uh, hope to hear some questions soon. Hi everyone, my name is Alice Carey and I'm going to take you through some work that we did in Dagoretti in establishing the occurrence of a microbial resistance Campylobacter species. Campylobacter is a major cause of football infection and has been shown to routinely cause diarrhea in children under the age of five years. Some of the drivers for antimicrobial resistance include antimicrobial use, overuse, and misuse in human and animals. Uh, AMR is a major threat to the global public health. The objective of our study was to, to understand the prevalence and antimicrobial resistance profiles of Campylobacter jejuni and Campylobacter coli isolated from children, food, and domestic animals in Dagoretti. We carried out a cross-sectional study whereby we visited 590 households between May and October this year. Some of the samples collected were sold samples from children aged between 6 months to 24 months, a food sample prepared for the child, and stool from livestock owned by the household or the neighboring household. To identify Campylobacter, we carried out culture in the lab. Uh, we also ran some chemical identifications and further confirm the isolates using PCR. Um, for the confirmed isolates, we carried out uh, some phenotypic susceptibility testing using this diffusion and used just locus guidelines for the interpretation on whether resistant or susceptible. We analyzed a uh, total of 1,389 samples, of which 554 were still samples from children, 590 were food samples, and 250 five or livestock samples. Uh, among these, we were able to isolate and confirm using PCR 150 to be Campylobacter of Campylobacter species. Here is a diagrammatic representation of uh, the positive Campylobacter isolates across species. So from this diagram, we can be able to, to tell that our poultry were, had the highest prevalence at 67%, followed by pigs uh, at 60%. We didn't isolate any Campylobacter from the food samples. So far, we have tested 135 isolates against a panel of six commonly used antibiotics. Uh, among these antibiotics, Ciprofloxacin have been shown to have the highest prevalence of resistance at 37%, followed by tetracycline at 35%. Uh, there is no resistance that have been shown against gentamicin and among these seven. So in conclusion, the data that we have generated from this study will be used in formulating interventions that will guide on antimicrobial use and lead to improved quality of life. Uh, the data will also contribute to the AMR data surveillance that will impact on clinical practice and policy making. Thank you.
Hello everyone, my name is Gizeneza Aksa, a microbiologist. I'm going to present on disinfectant susceptibility profile of bacteria isolated from slaughtered indigenous chicken in Nairobi, Kenya. Disinfectants are the products which are used to kill or inhibit microorganisms, including bacteria. However, as to occur with the antibiotics, different microorganisms are developing resistance toward the disinfectants, hence threaten food security and food safety. The aim of this study was to check the anti uh, disinfectant prof susceptibility profile of Essentia coli, Staphylococcus, and Streptococcus against six different disinfectants, where each disinfectant five concentration was co con considered and tested by using agar well diffusion technique. As to recommended the user concentration as shown by the bar figure below, at which all the isolates were supposed to be susceptible. Unfortunately, with some disinfectant, the isolates were not susceptible at that concentration. However, with other disinfectant, the isolates were even susceptible, even below the, the below to the concentrations below recommended user concentration. The reason being, from this study, it has shown that the active ingredients of disinfectant played a very big role in killing the bacteria. Also, the concentration was, were, 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 were uh, another important factor. The higher the concentration, the more the activity of disinfectant in killing and beating those um, bacteria. Farmers who want to intensify their poultry production, especially broilers, keepers, they may need to use to buy disinfectant for cleansing by checking on the active ingredients of the disinfectant and check what targeted microorganisms are for that particular disinfectant and where applicable if it is not including all bacteria being gram positive and gram negative and other microorganisms such as virus they may buy two different disinfectants which may be more effective in killing both bacteria and viruses and fungus for more information on this paper the email is provided below I can provide more information or it can be found on Google Scholar, Hindawi and University of Nairobi website. Thank you for listening. Good afternoon. My name is Panongoi Limbaso, a PhD graduate fellow at Hildry under the B&J project. I will give a presentation on the application of whole genome sequencing in tracking circulating strains of Rift Valley fever in human populations in Kenya. Human RVF cases continue to occur and are being detected more frequently and over wider geographical areas in Kenya and the East African region as highlighted in the maps below. In Kenya, RVF is listed among the top five priority zoonotic diseases and is reportable in both the human and livestock health sectors. Worldwide, there is little data on RVF genetic diversity due to the limited number of RVF disease events, which mostly occur as outbreaks in five to 15 year cycles associated with periods of heavy rainfall. RVF activity has been shown to occur during the epidemic periods in endemic countries, including Kenya. There is a general concern that viral evolution, which can impact virulence and spread, can occur during this period, but may go undetected due to the limited surveillance in host and vector species. To address this gap, we set out to gather genomic data from a pool of over 1,700 archived human samples collected from RVF outbreak events. These samples were collected from four broad regions in Kenya between 1997 to 2020, as highlighted in the table above. Virus isolation was performed in cell culture in the Cambry BSL3. This was followed by RNA extraction, PCR, and sequencing of the PCR positive RVF isolates using the Illumina platform at ILRI. To date, we have inoculated over 200 samples, observed CP in 70, as shown on the slide. Of the 70 CP positive samples, 25 were positive for RVF on PCR using the Altona kit. Libraries were prepared for the positive RVF sample 
and whole genomes recovered from 15 samples collected in 1997, 2007, 2018, 2019, and 2020 from different regions as highlighted in the tables below. On analysis, prelim preliminary analysis has shown that all the isolates belong to lineage C, clustering with, with RBF associated with recent outbreaks in Kenya in 2007, Uganda in 2015-2017, and Sudan in 2010. Analysis is ongoing to detect any amino acid suspicious on the two major surface proteins, the G1 and the G2, associated with viral attachment and entry into the cell. In conclusion, whole genome sequencing is a critical tool in monitoring RBF strains during and between outbreaks. RBF is a priority zoonotic disease in Kenya and requires a One Health approach in surveillance, detection, and evolution to detect potential changes that may have impacts on its virulence and transmission. In conclusion, uh, I want to thank the organizers for the opportunity to present in this conference. I also want to thank BMZ for funding this project. I also want to thank Ild and Kemri for uh, availing lab space for this work. And last but not least, I thank my colleagues Juma, Dr. Bet, Dr. Oyola, Professor Rosemary Sang, and Dr. Christina for their support and mentorship. Thank you. Well, many thanks, Dr. Konongoi, for that very interesting presentation on, um, on RVF. I think many of the presenters for the flash talks will be on chat. So for the questions, please place them there, and I'm sure they'll be answering them as we move along. Um, according to our program, we were to have a talk uh, on inter-household decision-making patterns on uptake of preventive and curative veterinary practices in communities affected by RVF. That talk is not there, but instead we're moving on to the next talk, which is an exciting one. Uh, I see we have a whole 30 minutes for this. On One Health Studies, uh, are the Animal Human Environmental Interface in Oloisukut Conservancy in Narok County. And this is going to be done by Dr. Rastas Mulinge, who I came to know maybe 12 years ago here as students, <laughs> just well back. Um, and together with Zipora Gitao, who does applied um, parastology at the University of Nairobi for her um, MSc, and also Christina from Western University of Health Sciences, also doing an MSc in public health. So Dr. Rastas, we Thank take the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Rastas Mulinge from Kemri, and I'm going to present uh, this study on behalf of Zipora Gitao and Christina, who, Christina, who is uh, away in the US, Zipora is with us, and also on behalf of the other consortium members, Dr. Odongo is with us and Hebard. Uh, this study is on One Health studies at human animal environment interface in the Oloisokut Conservancy in Narrow County. Um, this conservancy uh, provides a, a good platform to apply One Health because um, the people and the animals um, live in the same environment and uh, together with wildlife. So it is really a, a good environment for us to conduct one of the studies. Um, according to the definition of One Health, it is an integrative effort of multiple disciplines working locally, nationally, globally, to attain optimal health for people, animals, and the environment. And in Kenya, in the year 2012, um, the One Health program was initiated and there followed the creation of the Zoonotic Disease Unit under the Minister of Health. Um, and this was done in collaboration with several ministries, Minister of Health, Livestock, Environment, where they came up with a five-year plan on implementation of One Health activities in the country. Um, this platform uh, listed uh, um, a number of diseases that were to be considered as priority for implementation of One Health. So back to the conservancy. This conservancy was initiated in the year, in the year 2006. It is located in Transmara West, Narok County. And this is part of the Greater Mara 
segregate the ecosystem. Um, the, conservancy, the Conservancy has a membership of 109 households. And at the time of sampling, the, the population of livestock was 21,200 cattle, um, 35,850 sheep and goats, 881 dogs. So the activities that we carried out in this conservancy uh, used this one or other approach in that we, we did studies on people, animals, and the environment. And the one health approach is the one that considers funding, data correction, analysis, implementation of control interventions, as opposed to separate budget and health professionals working in silos. At the beginning of the project, we, we, we started with some incentives given to the community there or in the conservancy. Um, all the dogs were vaccinated against the rabies and um, canine distemper, and they were also dewormed against intestinal ailments. Later, uh, the community was also treated for sweat transmitted ailments. And therefore, samples were collected from the people, from the dogs, livestock, and the wildlife that is currently being uh, collected. And therefore, this study, as I said in the beginning, is composed of three abstracts, one on, on intestinal enemies in dogs, and another one on prevalence of intestinal parasitic infection in humans by Zipora Gitao, and another one on the knowledge, attitude, and practices by Dr. Christina. So the, during the sampling process, or the, during the sampling exercise, uh, we collected samples from the community. And in, in, in this, during that time, we did the uh, CAP surveys. You could see in the picture, second picture up there, we were doing some of the interviews actually with the people. Uh, later, we did the human study where we collected data from people. Uh, we collected fecal samples for analysis. We collected fecal samples from dogs and uh, samples from blood samples and fecal samples from livestock. The picture down here is, um, and this, this, is, this was an activity that we did in the conservancy because some of the analysis was done in the conservancy office. The study on intestinal ailments in dogs, uh, this study was carried out um, in partly in the field and part of it in Cambry. And we published a paper entitled A Survey of Intestinal Ailments in Domestic Dogs in a Human Animal Environmental Interface, the so good Conservancy in Arok County. So the, we all know how uh, dogs are in terms of the interaction with people. Um, many studies have shown that uh, dogs play a very critical role in the social being of people. And um, besides that, dogs also transmit very important uh, diseases, particularly in this case, uh, parasitic diseases. Uh, of importance to us is uh, cystic echinococcosis. The, 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 picture of the first picture demonstrates how severe uh, cystic echinococcosis appears in humans, specifically in uh, domestic, uh, in, uh, in um, pastoralist communities. Uh, the second one is the same disease in uh, livestock. Um, it infects mainly the liver and the lungs, but also other body organs, or also other organs in the in the in the in the body the the picture to the right uh, presents um, what we call the cystic uh, cysticercosis but mainly um, uh, presentation of um, tinea and tigena in livestock um, uh, and, and this 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 particular disease is actually of major economic importance as well as the tinea, tinea office, which causes cysticercosis in, in, in livestock as well, particularly in sheep caused by tinea office. And the last picture is um, one of the most important actual neglected diseases in, in, the, in the region uh, called synuriosis. Uh, the, the, it's a formation of uh, cysts in the brain of small livestock, and it's caused by a dog transmitted the tapeworm called tinea multiceps. So dogs also transmit further diseases of interest to the people. The first two pictures demonstrate what we call cutaneous larval migrants. This is uh, mainly uh, when people are get, uh, get infected by ancelostoma species, particularly Brasiliensis and the caninum. 
because um, these cutaneous labor migrants. Um, Toxocara canis, Toxocara catis from dogs and cats respectively uh, cause ocular lava migrants, the second picture. You can see a worm in the eye of a patient. Uh, this is caused by dog parasites. Um, and the, 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 the figure below, the, lower, the, the photograph below demonstrates the infection of, uh, of uh, tapeworm called spirometra species. Um, which is uh, transmitted by dogs as well, and it causes a disease we call spagnosis. Um, Cryptosporidium and giardiasis are um, protozoan infections that are very important in um, immunocompromised people, particularly Cryptosporidium. And, and uh, uh, dogs transmit these uh, parasites to people and livestock as well. Um, how we did the study? Um, we started with the vaccination of the dogs, again, rabies and canine distemper, and the dogs were dewormed. Um, we collected fecal samples from 100 dogs, and the samples were processed uh, in Cambry. Um, these 100 fecal samples represented uh, 76 out of the 109 households in the conservancy. And the pictures there demonstrate the group that did this, this work. Uh, together with the vaccination. So from this study, um, well, we found out that of the 100 dogs that were examined, 65 of them uh, had at least an infection with one helmet. And we also found out that ukworm was the most common uh, species followed by tinea, uh, followed by spirometra and tinnates and the others in that order. Um, we noticed that of the 76 households that we sampled, 54, 54, uh, 54 households are dogs infected with at least one helmet. Of importance to note here is that the parasites that we detected in dogs are, are of quite uh, great significance in terms of public health, um, Toxocara species, uh, Toxocara catis and Toxocara canis, um, particularly in this case, uh, Toxocara canis um, cause diseases in humans, as well as uh, the ukwam species, tinea species. All these are important parasites can cause zoonosis. The, the, the other parasites uh, cause uh, diseases in dogs. Some of them cause very dis severe diseases, like for example, Anastrostoma caninum causes bleeding. Um, all these diseases are of importance in terms of the health of the animals. And more importantly, also that uh, the parasites we detected in these dogs, some of them are acquired from wildlife. Uh, for example, Tinea cerearis and Tinea modegi are uh, Tinea species that are acquired from dogs interacting with, with wildlife. When dogs prey in the, in the wild, they come across antelopes, the, the natural, the, 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 the hair from the, from, from the wildlife, and this is how the dogs get infected. From this study, we can conclude that nine, nine genera of intestinal parasites were detected in dogs, and hookworm species were the most uh, common species in dogs. The study also reports uh, the detection of uh, spirometra teireri as the most, as uh, um, teireri, diplidium caninum, and mesostades uh, for the first time in the country. The zoonotic elements found in dogs uh, pose uh, great risk to the people because they're infectious in people. And uh, the, the helmets also reported in this study show a clear, in, in, a clear information that our dogs, the dogs in that conservancy interact uh, with wildlife. And therefore we recommend the control of these helmets in, in dogs, humans, and wildlife calls for corroborative effort from the human animal environmental health professionals in the context of One Health. So the next study is the one on um, prevalence of intestinal parasitic infection in humans by Zipora Gitao, who is a, an MSc student in University of Nairobi, supervised by Dr. Odongo and myself. Um, parasitic infections are, uh, are of great importance in terms of public health because they cause great uh, burden of disease uh, into people. And they are common in areas where, where uh, sanitation is poor and hygiene practices. They are transmitted mainly through 
fecal oral route, either through food or water, insects, and to some extent uh, through by animals in the uh, uh, zoonosis. And the WHO uses the, um, the warming as, as a measure to, to stop these infections. So therefore in Kenya in the year 2012, the, 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 our country started the national school-based deworming program with the aim to reduce infections in, in people and the associated morbidity. Uh, this uh, program was started in areas with uh, eye infections. These, are, these were actually the initial the, um, provinces where the, the infection rates were more than 20%. This was Nyanza, Western, uh, coastal province and part of Rift Valley. But despite all this, um, the program is faced by a number of challenges that even when people are dewarmed, they get frequently reinfected. The program is uh, based on school programs, but it doesn't take care of the other people in the community. Uh, there's growing evidence showing uh, drug resistance um, to the drugs being used. Um, uh, even after um, the warming, the, the environment which, in which these people live is not taken care of. So the people still get contaminated by the soil where they live, soil water and other parameters. And there's also that possibility of uh, transmission through zoonosis. So the study, um, this study involved collection of uh, recruitment of patients or participants. You can see the features there that my colleagues were, were recruiting patients or participants, they collected samples and the samples were analyzed uh, partly in the field. This is in the, in, the, in the field and partly in Cambry. So the results from this study indicated that um, there was quite high prevalence of uh, parasitic infection in the people. Uh, by, the mess, by the first method, which was done in the lab in Cambry, 57% of the people were infected with at least one parasitic infection. And by the second method, which was done in the field, CATOCAT is mainly done on um, ailments. So they don't, they, it's not applied for protozoans. And uh, the prevalence was 32%. This range is actually in the range of that region because the earlier study that before the program started had um, um, a range of 50, about 53% infections. So from this study, we observed that and Amoeba histolytica, Dispa, Moskofisky complex was the most con common, common infection with 32%, 33%, followed by Tuturis tuturia. And by the both methods, they agreed that most uh, Tuturis tuturia was the most common infection. We also found um, Ascaris rubricoides in terms of helminths by Catocat and, and Fomoita concentration. We found Ancelostoma species or Nekita americanas, the hookworms. And interestingly, we found a few cases of uh, human infected with tinea species, which we think is most likely tinea saginata, but we'll type that to be able to, to know the uh, species. Um, uh, addition, we, we intend to type the Jadia rabia because we know some, some of the Jadia assemblages are known to be zoonotic, just to find out whether some of this uh, could be uh, infections from animals, as well as the hookworm species. Uh, there are hookworm species that are infectious in humans that, but originate from animals, particularly Ancelostoma selenicum, which comes from dogs. So from that study, we, we found out that women were more infected than males. And the age bracket between five and 14 was the most common infected uh, population. And the infection, increased with age. And therefore, um, as our conclusion for this study, we found out that the infection of intestinal protozoan infections suggests that the conservancy of these people live in poor water and sanitation, uh, poor water, sanitation, and hygiene conditions. And the high prevalence uh, of ailments in non-targeted population um, requires attention. This, this is to mean that because the, the, most of the programs are based on school going children, they leave out the, those, two that, those that are not in school or the under population, there is need to focus on those neglected the, or left out populations. 
to have a whole uh, impact. Then the presence of the tinea species confirms the occurrence of zoonosis in the community. And therefore we recommend that the entire community is included in a compressive health and protozoan control program. Because as you have seen, and uh, uh, from the, even from the ministry point of view that the, the control programs just does the warming or ailments, but does not uh, consider um, the uh, treatment of protozoans. And you could see the, the infections was very high in the community. The last study is the one on one, is the one on knowledge attitude practices relating to risk factors for zoonotic diseases in the Olesukut Conservancy using a one health approach. And this was by Christina from the University of um, Elsa, Western University of Health Sciences, California, the US, and the other partners. So this study um, involved 15 of the 15 households out of the one or nine households in the community and used a one health approach and participatory uh, epidemiology to collect data on people, animals, and their environment. And the goals for this was to highlight the major risk factors and their needs that perpetuate the transmission of neglected diseases prioritized by WHO and the, the zoonotic disease unit. Uh, the study also sought to, to, to understand cultural norms specific to the conservancy residents. And lastly, tailor culturally sensitive and sustainable control strategies that will be recommended for implementation at the local level. For the CAP study, uh, the survey assess the degree of the knowledge of zoonotic diseases, um, their transmission, treatment, and prevention. The attitude towards uh, the zoonotic diseases and practices and general behavior that impact on the risk of exposure. So the results, the result, the results show that uh, out, of the, out of the questions that were being asked um, uh, from the households, that, uh, for example, the first question, do you, know, do you know these diseases, for example, anthrax, brucellosis, cystic echinococcosis, rabies, tuberculosis, and trypanosomiasis? The second question was asking whether they know whether it affects people or whether they know it affects animals. And uh, they responded by showing that they knew most of these diseases, but a few people, uh, a few of them didn't understand that diseases like uh, cystic uh, cystic uh, so, sorry brucellosis brucellosis uh, yeah brucellosis no uh, cystic echinococcosis and uh, trypanosomiasis affected people and um, they they didn't know that uh, brucellosis and tuberculosis are also infectious in animals so for the second part of the question was whether they knew what causes the, the disease how the disease is treated and how to prevent it. And it's clear that some of the respondents uh, did not know what causes the disease, particularly for anthrax and cystic echinococcosis. Others did not know how to treat it, uh, um, like trypanosomiasis, and how to prevent it. Um, so these are the responses that we got, the responses that we got from the, from the people interviewed. As part of group, uh, focus group discussion, we came across a, a goat that was infected with um, sonura cerebraris, uh, what I mentioned earlier, sonoriosis. It's uh, the level stage of uh, uh, tinea morticeps. And the local community called the disease there omilo. It's a very common disease in the area. Uh, people knew about it. And um, it causes uh, some severe um, uh, clinical symptoms in, 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 in sheep and goats. And with the permission from the, the owner of the goat, we were able to, to slaughter the goat and remove the, remove the, the, the cysts and use this as an example to, to, to train them on how the disease is transmitted and how it can be prevented. So this is a common disease according to the people in the area. And also our dog studies in the area show that um, this parasite exists in the, in the dogs, meaning that it's transmitted to the, to, the, to, the, to the livestock. 
And uh, one, 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 one thing about this disease is that every infected animal, the end result is death. So it's, it's a disease that causes serious economic losses to the, to the people. So from the respondents, they, they, they showed that they understood how the disease, some of the diseases were trans being transmitted and prevented, like for example, diseases like, such as rabies. Uh, this was through contact with dogs, uh, sleeping sickness. Uh, this is uh, through fly. And they, they thought that the, the sessefly in this case were being brought by elephants who, which live in the, in the conservancy. So the, the people had really clear understanding of the disease and the, the prevention. And this is a case of uh, uh, anthrax in, in, the, in the conservancy. So what we conclude from this, we conclude that there was limited awareness of zoonotic diseases, a limited understanding of the transmission routes. Um, uh, the, the people were most aware with diseases of, diseases of uh, higher consequences such as rabies, because rabies causes death or diseases that cause high uh, livestock production losses, such as TB and brucellosis. There was inadequate uh, or improper water, sanitation and hygiene in the, in the conservancy, and that people also lived with animals, that the presence of wildlife increased the risk of transmission. We, we, from this study, we were able to establish factors that contributed to the disease, uh, perpetuating the diseases, the zoonotic disease, and this included lack of access to clean water, lack of health, health education, lack of access to health care, lack of access to veterinary health care, and la lack of access to education. And therefore, this study, this pilot study provided baseline data and identified adaptable, adapted control measures for the implementation of sustainable interventions. The proposed uh, combination of One Health and the participatory Epidemiology could be used in other pastoral communities for disease control and prevention. Uh, towards the end, uh, some community uh, projects were initiated and uh, study with collecting of uh, rainwater. Uh, the Minister of Health pledged to, to, to construct additional dams for the, for, the, for the people and their livestock. The Minister of Health, through the Account Director of Health, uh, deployed a clinical officer and a, a, and a lab technician to the health center and also provided more equipment and supplies. Um, the county veterinary services implemented the control vector programs. And this is to, to control vectors that such as SESA and others, SESA fly and others, and also started the livestock, selective livestock breeding programs to increase meat and milk yield. Uh, a veterinary officer was also deployed in the conservancy to implement the vaccination programs and disease control programs. And um, a, a local ag agrovet is planning to start uh, a veterinary depot in, in, the, in the conservancy. Uh, the community recommended implementation of preventive measures against predators. This is the, by use of fencing and use of lion lights. And therefore, the intersectoral, intersectoral, intersectoral collaboration and community participation were critical to the implementation of these interventions. So I acknowledge the following, the director of the conservancy, the, the county officials from the Minister of Health, Veterinary Services and Water, and all the, the other group, uh, groups that uh, contributed to this work and uh, the people represented by these institutions. Thank you very much for inviting me to come and present this and for listening. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Doc, for a really nice presentation. I think it's very holistic uh, mm -hmm. what you are doing uh, within, within the conservancy. Um, I have a question, and I'm sure there will be questions from the audience as well. Yes. The first one, I see your final slide on the recommendations, yes. uh, almost like a little bit disconnected from Mm -hmm. from what from what you're doing uh, which sort of speaks to how we approach um, health yes. so uh, it seems like from the farmers or the people in the conservancy they they, they worry about predators yes they do. the livestock sector went for breeding programs <laughs> yes um and 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 there are clear you know disease issues as well 
so what would be a comment on that? And the second question related to that is, you, you have done, I think, what we don't often do with One Health. We look for one disease like rabies, yes. but you have looked at multiple infections. And the NTD programs uh, that are looking to leave no one behind and eliminate many of these NTDs are advocating for integrated programs. Yes. What, what, what would be your thoughts around integrating control programs for not just rabies, but also the helmings that you are talking about in this presentation? Okay. Uh, maybe I can answer this the first question. Maybe Ebert will help me with the second question. The first one. Um, the, the, the approach that we used or the approach that you are saying is quite important because even from the first slide, I mean, it's um, many people are doing research on, on their own. Like for example, uh, I come from Cambridge. Um, Dr. David Odongo is from the University of Nairobi. Maybe they have a project there or others that we work with, but they, they, they do it on their own. But from our own approach point of view, we, we decided to, to look at the, the, uh, a quite large profile of diseases uh, at a go. And this, 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 from the economic sense of view, it also saves money. And it's able to, when we combine the data together, we are able to, to give um, quite a well-informed um, findings from this particular area. So I think the, the aspect of integrating many, many sectors working together uh, gives out a, a good, a better outcome rather than opposed to people going on their own. Maybe Ebert could uh, answer the answer on uh, the first one. So the initial idea to create such a program was um, um, everybody talks about One Health, but um, it is more or less a theoretical approach and we wanted a practical approach to see what is possible in a community and, and what factors can be brought together to do something in One Health. So uh, the first start, we started with uh, do a disease profile. We went in the community and asked them, what is your problem? What are the diseases? What do you know about the diseases? Do you know the transmission? And this is then part and parcel of the, of the outcome what was uh, just uh, reported. The problem we have only is that we had very little funding, so we had to do bit by bit. And that's why we wanted to do it all comprehensive and that we have the data together and then go one step forward. Additionally, we approached in the authorities uh, in NAROC and the veterinary services and the medical services and asked them now, where do you come in? We want the One Health project, so you must come in. So they pledged what he has reported. They, they said, well, uh, the, the, the dispensary was underfunded by uh, uh, had not enough for personnel and the dispensary was not equipped very well so they stepped in then the veterinary people came in with uh, uh, um, providing as well personnel for the veterinary services and our idea was to use them community-based that they live with the community and go around from time to time to have in to, to do a kind of surveillance what is going on is an up and down are the diseases uh, um, periodical and whatsoever and um, this is the background of the whole thing. And we are still in midst of the whole thing. It's not finalized and we want to see and then do it on a yearly basis to see what, what can be done in so disease surveillance. Many thanks for that. Um, Leanne, questions online? There is one, one question online um, that is asking if you were able to comment on the extent of implementation of One Health at the um, county level. So how well um, One Health has been institutionalized within Norrock County. Um, and I know I'll, I'll address this to you, but I know we've got some of the experts in the, in the room. So maybe this could be a jointly answered question. <laughs> Thank you. Um, this, this is quite uh, difficult for me to, 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 com to comment because this is actually the whole county. But particularly the area we are working on, we the, the, the county officials, both in the Ministry of Health and the Veterinary Services have really supported us in implementing our project. But from the count perspective, I will be, uh, 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 it is very difficult for me to, to comment. Yeah, thank you. Um, <clears throat> the question is about the implementation of the One Health approach. 
uh, at the county level. I would uh, say that uh, is not optimum yet, but at Narrow County, we have quite uh, a variety of activities that are going on under the One Health uh, approach. And uh, we are escalating that. And uh, we have some partners, Ilri being one of them, uh, in the various activities they are doing and also some other partners like uh, the Red Cross CP3 project. So there are quite a number of activities that we are uh, performing with our One Health approach. And uh, we, we, we have had quite some collaboration with the health uh, component, um, including a consultative meeting to make reports uh, last week. And we would probably soon have a consultative forum to even escalate that further with Ilri as a host. So there's something going on with the held, uh, one held approach. Okay, any other question, comment? Yes. Yeah, comment. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Molinga and your team. Uh, my comment is that uh, you have looked at all the issues which touch on the one health and you have brought them to the fore, because I see in your presentation, the findings and recommendations, you look at water, you look at uh, animal health, you look at people, and it means you have brought the three pillars of the One Health together. And I think your findings, though it may not look very scientific, it may not look like conclusive, but it provides a very good baseline of what somebody can pick to address a one health issue in that particular area. So I think, uh, as you mentioned, it is uh, still work in progress, but I think it, we can learn from it that if I want to study helminthosis in uh, a narrow and find the best way to uh, control it, you have brought all the uh, factors contributing to it. And I think that's a very important aspect. Thank you. Uh, many thanks for that. I have one final one, uh, particularly to the to Dr. Muturi here, <laughs> and I'm calling out on him because you direct the Zoonotic Disease Unit of Kenya. From what um, Erastas has, uh, has has described today, it sounds like the dog is an important animal, not just for rabies, uh, but also for for helmets. And you have a whole strategy on uh, rabies elimination within the country. What what would be your thoughts around how to take in this kind of information that comes from the researchers in terms of control of uh, zoonosis? Um, <laughs> you're allowed to push me because you're my supervisor, so <laughs> that's okay. But I think uh, yeah, it's quite interesting what was presented. Unfortunately, in government, um, a lot of our strategies are very disease specific but we are alive to the fact that um, evidence is always evolving and we need to, to adapt. In a sense, um, we are doing some work in CIA and one of the things the communities wanted is besides us just vaccinating their dogs, a lot of these dogs were in really bad condition. So we had to, in a way, buy the warmers and also besides the disease part, also improve the animal welfare which ultimately affects the outcomes of other infections by, for example, deworming them. So I think because contingency plans like the rabies plans are living documents that need to be changed over time, we'll definitely uh, make some of those changes where we advocate for vaccinations plus, for example, deworming programs going together because the cost of deworming are quite low. And if you do it together, the overall cost will go down as opposed to tackling one disease at a time. So. Uh, we'll definitely be reaching out to the team. It's amazing work. Awesome. And I'm sure Oreka is also working in uh, Machakos on rabies. <laughs> this message is for all of us. Great. I think uh, many thanks, uh, Rastas and your team. Really appreciate. Um, because we just have a few more minutes. I'll ask Nick to come over and you can do the main tea, which is meant to, you should have done it after the tea break, but how about you do it right now so as we come back and have the panel discussions around table that will happen after this. For those online, the code is above. 
when you ask for the code for the mentee. Let's reflect on the talks that you've heard today. So how has your understanding on One Health been influenced by today's presentations on the flash talks? Either from the morning, the mid morning, and in also in the afternoon. Let's hear. Yeah, somebody says it's evolving, it's evolving, and we need to keep up with the evidence from research. That's true. More urban planning. Yeah. yeah somebody mentions that it's hard to draw boundaries for disease. That's true. Yeah, the need to work together, especially in the One Health framework. Yeah, somebody says you're still narrowing down to AMR and zoonosis. Yeah. Somebody also says that you need to move ahead from the two sectors, animal and human health. Yeah, then Rasta, somebody is happy that the work at Narok is a good example of One Health approach. Well done. One Health is very wide. Yeah. So the call is to have more collaboration between the sectors. Let's go next. Also again, what distinguishes One Health from other research approaches, especially now that the people are asking that we do more collaboration in a One Health base. Let's see, using one word, why is One Health research different? Yeah, specificity, collaborative, transdisciplinary, cross-cutting, holistic, collaboration, communication, interdependency, theory of change, Michelle, from your presentation, theory of change. Yeah, great. I wonder why, and what about, what about the other approaches before, how was it before? Mark, maybe you can, how was it before the One Health approach? No idea, you've been on the One Health framework all along. All right, so thanks everyone for the first session of the afternoon. So we'll get back quarter to four for the panel discussion. So we'll have also some questions that we would want to ask our panelists or you want to hear from our panelists. So keep an eye for that. All right, thanks everyone. See you in a bit. I am Ilri, scientist and bioscience communications manager. Uh, but before we get started, I'd like um, to, to, to share a couple of things uh, to our panelists. Um, please ensure that you are able to switch on your video. Um, IT should be able to help us with this <laughs> in order to have a roundtable discussion. Um, and I'd also like to encourage all of you online to please insert your questions to the chat functions for our panelists. So can we all confirm with a thumbs up that we're able to switch on our videos? Great. Thank you. Okay. So... <clears throat> Earlier this morning, we heard our DG share the definition of One Health, which is in line with uh, the Tripartite Plus. But we've also heard that this space is large. And depending on who you speak to, you know, the perspectives can vary. Uh, today, we aim to speak with experts who can share their insights um, on this subject. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our esteemed panelists. Um, and we'll get them pinned so you can all see them. Um, Eleanor Opondo who's a professor at the Stellenbosch University in South Africa. Uh, welcome, Eleanor. Uh, Jeanette Dawa, who's a medical epidemiologist at Washington State University. Salome Bukachi, associate professor at the University of Nairobi's Institute of Anthropology. Jason Sersoli, e ecosystems ecologist here at Ilri, Nairobi. And Eric Fev, a professor of veterinary infectious disease and global health from the University of Liverpool and jointly appointed scientist at ILRI. Welcome to all of you. In order to kick off uh, this session, I'd like to ask all of you um, a question. What does One Health mean to you in the context of work that you do? Uh, we're gonna start with Eleanor, Jeanette, Salome, Eric, and Jason. Thank you. All right. Um, so just to give you a um, a bit of background on what I do. My background is medicine, clinical epidemiology, and evidence-based healthcare. And my work typically revolves around research in evidence-based healthcare and evidence-based policy. So I'm pretty much into the health sector. I'm not really a One Health specialist, but they are very, they are very clear um, similar principles with the transdisciplinary approach one Health is our transdisciplinary um, area. The same thing with evidence-based healthcare. Nowadays, when, when it comes to making decisions at both the international 
national level is a request for integrated information to make decisions, evidence about qualitative research, quantitative research, cost effectiveness from various sectors. So I would say those are the similarities, a transdisciplinary approach in my work and similarities with one help. Thank you, Eleanor. Uh, Jeanette, over to you. Uh, thanks, Hector. So in my line of work, um, which is um, research on zoonosis, uh, my emphasis would be when we look at a zoonosis, we're looking at the human health aspect as well as the animal health aspect. Um, there's the question about, you know, vector borne diseases. Um, it's something we want to look into. Uh, when it comes to the environment, climate change is something we also want to look into. So when it comes to One Health research, I would say in my day to day, it's about humans and animals, but understanding that there's more to it, but the capacity to address all of it is a bit of a challenge. There's something Elena um, mentioned, you know, she mentioned that she's, she's not really a One Health person, but if we have a One Health outlook, I think all of us are supposed to be One Health practitioners, but then understanding what our role is as a One Health practitioner, it's something that I agree with Elena sometimes, it's not too clear uh, what it should be. Thank you. Salome, over to you. Uh, thank you, uh, Ekta. Uh, so I'm a medical anthropologist and my work involves um, looking at human behavior and how that impacts on various uh, developmental issues. So um, I've specialized in uh, medical anthropology in relation to infectious and zoonotic diseases. So my work has involved um, an in uh, interface or the integration between the various disciplines to be able to solve a particular disease. Uh, have worked together with veterinarians, medical um, doctors, um, entomologists, ecologists to try and uh, find a solution to a specific problem. Initially, it started as multidisciplinary, but increasingly it's becoming transdisciplinary where it's not just about each component coming in to do their bit, but all of us weaving whatever we are doing together and coming up with a common holistic solution. Thank you. Thank you, Salome. Um, Jason? Thanks, Ekta. Uh, I, so I'm an ecologist and a conservation biologist. At this time, I mostly work in communal grazing lands, helping, uh, helping to improve management of those lands, mostly through combined institutional strengthening, along with improving the, the technical capacity of those, those institutions to manage grazing lands. And so I see One Health and specifically the control of especially animal disease and zoonoses, parasites, as a way of adding value to the uh, rangeland management approaches that we use. Uh, and so I, th I, think it's a, I think it's a very significant area and we're still developing approaches where we can improve rangeland health at the same time that we are also improving the health of animals. Uh, and so, but this is a very, this is a very new area. Uh, and uh, we, but we see quite a few opportunities. And, um, and I should also note that in uh, pastoralist rangelands, there is the uh, very significant uh, fact that the health of the ecosystem is linked uh, very directly to the health of, of livestock and also to food security and nutritional security in these areas where milk is the, is the, main, uh, is the, is the main source of nutrition and food. Uh, as well as well as for livelihoods, economically speaking, that's most of the income in these areas, and so uh, it's it's quite uh, it's it's quite direct linked that you have in pastoral systems, which you might not have otherwise. Where environmental health, which is different from ecosystem health, let's we have to separate those two. Environmental health is a public health concept. Ecosystem health is an ecological concept. The health of the ecosystem itself, whereas environmental health is everything that affects the health of people from the environment. And so, but in the case of pastoralist rangelands, the, uh, the, the fact that the health of the ecosystem links to the health of people 
is 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 quite significant and different from from most farming and other ecosystems where human health is tangentially or indirectly related to the health of a forest or a cropping system. There are times when there are direct links, but uh, generally not. It's generally not as direct. So thank you. Thank you, Jason. Uh, Eric, over to you. Thank you, Hector. Uh, well, and hello, everybody. Um, I guess what I would say is that uh, I, I'm very much in line with the definition that was presented this morning, which is really that it's about integrating. Um, it's an integrative approach that brings together the humans, animals, and, and, and the environment in the context of the health of each of those different components. So it's about the health of humans in the context of the health of animals and of the environment in which they live. It's the health of animals in the context of the humans who keep them or who live, share an environment with them. And it's the health of the environment that those animals and that those people use um, and how those different components impact and, and affect each other. And this at multiple spatial scales. So for me, the scale is really important. It can apply within a household. It's an approach that can apply at the scale of a village, of a community, of a county, or a whole country, or, and then of course we go to an international scale, it gets much harder to conceptualize the multitude of linkages at, at that much more international scale. But for me, the, the key thing is that this approach requires us to think in an integrated uh, and coherent way, which means disciplines need to communicate with each other. And really crucially, and we heard this from George in his uh, keynote speech this morning, that so, someone asked him uh, whether you know, he drifted away from his, his disciplinary roots. And he said, no, he still has his disciplinary root. And I think that's really important that it's not about becoming a generalist. It's about be remaining a specialist, but putting your specialism in the context of everybody else's specialism and allowing your specialism to evolve and to be influenced by the specialist thinking and approaches of other people. Thanks. Eric, before we move away from you, but in terms of specific work that you do, are you able to share where you uh, use One Health approaches? So uh, thank you for that. Um, the, the, the example I would choose is, is, is a, a study that we, uh, is a series of studies that, that we've conducted where the unit of interest is, let's say, a household nested within a series of uh, villages. And within those households, we're interested not just in human health or indicators of human wealth or animal health and indicators of animal health, but absolutely the relationship between what's going on in the animals and mechanistically how that impacts on, on the health and well-being of the people in those households. And though the transmission of the diseases that we, we were concerned with in that program influenced very heavily by the environment in which those people lived. So everything coming together, we have to measure in the science that we do, we're measuring something at a particular unit. And in that particular context, we chose the unit of the household. But those households are emblematic of relationships that are within themselves, within and, and within broader geographical scales. Yeah. Eric, thank you so much. Um, I think over to Nicholas to, to, to get to Menti, because we've heard some very broad um, perspectives, and we'd like to hear from you online as well um, on what you think uh, One Health uh, means to you and sort of the context uh, applied. Nick? Thanks, Hector. Let's, let's get the questions up. We are getting the questions up online so that you can engage the audience. So while we're waiting for Menti to, to pick up, um, anyone in the pan, uh, panelists, please, um, how do you often apply One Health approach in your daily work? Okay, I will answer that. Uh, so One Health approaches, though initially I said I'm not a One Health specialist, I just thought of an example of my recent work that where we um, attempted to use the One Health approach. Uh, we were tasked to provide evidence for the ministry to make recommendations and um, we had to look at um, data, synthesize information, look at existing systematic reviews. And this was about COVID. Um, so 
um, pretty much the studies that we looked at, some of them included uh, human beings, others are animals. But then so synthesizing that was easy on our part. But then the challenge that we had was uh, in communicating the evidence, the, the panelists were more inter interested in the information about uh, the human beings. So I couldn't fault them uh, because I think it was more a comfort zone. That is their area of speciality. So that is a, a classic example of where I was using a One Health approach, but then it was very challenging to communicate that integrated approach to the decision makers who had to make a decision to inform a policy. Thank you, Eleanor. Um, Nick, are we ready or do you need a few more minutes? Sure. Uh, in that case, Eric, um, we have a question from uh, Martin Guainaina who asks, how do universities train One Health approaches? And is, are there some universities with courses in One Health? Um, is this more effective or is it better if we were to have uh, course units in the different disciplines that may be involved? Thank you. Well, there, there's several people here in the room who've undertaken courses in One Health who may be better uh, uh, able to answer that than, than me. But I think, yes, the, the, the courses that teach One Health teach people to think integratively um, while building on their skills. So One Health courses, I, I would say, tend to be at master's level when people already have a, a, a basic uh, grounding in a particular discipline. And I think that's very appropriate. As I said before, we can't all be generalists. We have to be specialists, but then apply our specialisms in ways that that uh, that that allow us to be more general with them rather than just be generalists. In which case, we we don't have that much to offer. So, um, th those those courses in One Health teach people to take their specialist skills, to learn from a, a range of other skills. For example, a biologist learning from somebody like like Salome about the way people think about their livestock or their own health, and use that knowledge. To, to guide the work that they do in their own specialist discipline. Thank you, Eric. Um, Nick, are we ready to go into Menti now? Okay, so if you please answer the question that you have. So the audience, this is the response from the audience. They're saying that some say they're using One Health in terms for education, community education, others in research, some in outbreak investigation, for surveillance, especially for zoonotic diseases. There we go. I think everyone can see the screen now. So a lot of people are saying in research. Nick? So most One Health, we can see mostly has been taken up at the research level. Some at the control still, we're seeing that a lot has been coming through, especially for zoonotic diseases. And remember, we were saying that we don't need to narrow One Health into only zoonosis. But also, let's see what, what's coming in. Again, community, education, and disease risk, disease modeling, disease management and control, project appraisal, and research. Yeah, some, one of the veterinarians online is saying that they control disease at the animal level, especially for pets, like rabies, anthrax again. So, yeah, controlling disease spillover. So that's interesting because, um, thank you, Nick. Um, what's interesting is that it's all sort of very much so linked with uh, zoonotic diseases and spillover. Um, which brings me to uh, back to our panelists. I'd like to start with Eleanor and then to Jason. Um, Eleanor, starting with you, what are some of the challenges uh, that you are facing on applying One Health approaches? Um, all right. So in my work in research and evidence-based healthcare, we typically look at systematic reviews, uh, look at or conduct systematic reviews. One common denominator, at least of all the reviews that are involved in or reviewed or seen other groups um, conduct, is that when it comes to including studies, many authors tend to exclude studies done on animals, or rather exclude animal studies. So there you can see there's a getting a disconnect of the information people are keen on. Even on infectious diseases, some zoonotic diseases, typically most authors will uh, include studies conducted in human beings. And there are also um, such strategies and filters that can exclude animal studies. So when it comes now to actually not interpreting that data with animal studies excluded, that can be a challenge. 
So that is one aspect. And then, as I mentioned, um, the recent work my team did on COVID-19 COVID to inform policy on COVID-19, we came across studies that um, reviews that had included animal studies, but then in communicating that evidence to decision makers at the panel, the panelists were more keen on studies that involved um, um, human beings. So again, there's a challenge um, in that disconnect in that people have preference for human studies, but I guess it's more about the audience, people who commission the reviews, conduct the reviews. It's more about the area that they are more uh, comfortable in. So perhaps now integrated approaches should be more talked about. And I can talk about a current project that I'm involved in where we are tasked to develop an integrative approach to evidence-based healthcare and evidence-based decision-making. Because right now you can't really make decisions on just one aspect of health. There are so many players that you have to consider. Um, so recently, again, another project based, was based on an integrative approach, but that was on other aspects of health, different aspects of health. Animal studies were not included in that integrative approach. So from these discussions, I'm beginning to see the importance of also including animal studies in that integrative approach, not just thinking of the integrative approach when it pertains to human studies. But again, methodologies for that are still upcoming. There's some people who have conducted systematic reviews on animal studies, but again, I've been in presentations where when people are trying to present those studies, uh, the audience are more of, okay, what are the methods? Um, how do we synthesize information for human beings and animal studies? What are the implications? So still, yes, some people are appreciating One Health, but many people still find a challenge in connecting um, or understanding this integrative approach, especially when it comes to not crossing the line between animal and human studies. That's really interesting, Eleanor. Um, Jason, over to you for some thoughts. Well, I think, I think the main value of the One Health concept and approach is, is in action. Um, and, sure, and sure, research is needed in order to develop those actions, but I think uh, that, that's really where its main value is, is where uh, a, you have actions that are addressing the environment, uh, addressing animal health, addressing human health directly in each case, but in an integrated, uh, an overall integrated strategy. And, and that's, that's, where you, that's where I see One Health having big impacts in the real world. Um, and so I think, I think the, the biggest challenge, uh, as, as some of the other panelists ha have mentioned, is moving from being multidisciplinary to being transdisciplinary and really, really working together in an in integrative fashion, which is very, very difficult uh, because all of you are speaking different languages. You all have different knowledge sets even the questions that you're interested in are generally different. Uh, and, uh, and so I think uh, it, it's that challenge means you need, you need more to pay more attention in especially project planning, uh, developing the questions. It has to be from the beginning. And if it's, if it's, not, if it's not from the outset, then you're, you're kind of piecing it together in a haphazard fashion. Uh, you know, a patchwork as as you go, and so it's not it's not easy to take that time and 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 develop uh, truly integrative research. Uh, but that is where the strongest impact will, will come from. And I think uh, working in that transdisciplinary space it means everyone has to take others others' experience seriously. And um, and so this is especially challenging when. Uh, you know the the work the work that I do is is not is not just ecology is not just rangeland management. I work in pastoralist systems. That means you have to consider the entire social and institutional system, and you have to work with partners on the ground who are pastoralists and who represent pastoralists. And uh, that's and so taking that social context seriously is is not is not something that everyone is is ready is ready to do. Um, and uh, you know. Another another good example would be uh, I, I collaborate a lot with economists, and we speak very different languages. Uh, although we're all using English, of course, uh, and so um, it's it, it's uh, it's first of all about all getting on the same page, clear communication, 
making priorities clear and uh, and and starting off the the research development process or development intervention process uh, on, on a good foot. Thanks. Thanks, Jason. Um, Eric, if you don't mind, from what you've heard um, from Jason and Eleanor, are you able to share some reflections or even some of your own thoughts? Thanks. Well, one, one, one thing that I was thinking as Jason was talking there is, is that as, as researchers, but I think actually the research community is maybe not always the one we have to convince of the value of this approach. It's, as he's saying, the, the implementation community to, to take, take the risk of stepping outside of what they're comfortable with and working with people they don't normally work with. Uh, actually, let me take the example in Kenya here of the national strategy for antimicrobial resistance. And we often use AMR as, a, as an example of this sort of thing, but genuinely it's been, it's been grabbed by, by the horns, as it were, uh, as, an, as an area where health, uh, animal health and environment can collaborate and work together and where the, the genuine value in doing that is, is clear not only on paper, but, but in the outcome of that joined up approach. Um, so I think uh, it, it's, it's about risk taking to some extent for, the, for those communities who aren't necessarily comfortable with stepping outside of their disciplinary expertise. Maybe the funding is difficult. Maybe, maybe the culture is just not there to do that. To, to look broadly outside of where the work normally gets done and try and be more inclusive with other disciplines and great things come of that. And I think um, you know, AMR is a good example here in Kenya, but before AMR, the establishment of the Zoonotic Disease Unit uh, was a, a major bold step by, by government to create those linkages, which had very significant um, outcomes in terms of developing policy for disease control in terms of integrating the way surveillance was being done for a multitude of different different issues it did tend to focus on on zoonoses it was the zoonotic disease unit after all but i don't think there's any shame in in, in that at all and that they blazed the trail for what's now happening with with amr and which will will potentially happen for other issues too thanks Again, sorry, before I move away, so just to ask, do you believe that um, these establishments that were set up are reevaluating, or have they already started to, to ensure that there is more of an integrated approach? Oh, the, uh, well, in, in the case of uh, those institutional setups in, in, in Kenya, at least they were established with that integrated approach at the very core of what they do, and they've done that extremely well. Thanks, Eric. Um, back to Nick for a Menti question, please. What challenges do you face in applying One Health approaches? Uh, we'd like to hear from all of you in, um, in the virtual space. All right. Having listened to all of us and how we are applying One Health in our different spaces, it would be nice to hear the challenges that we encounter often in, in our day-to-day -day work. So please share your opinions on mentee. Or oh, are there no challenges that you encounter? And how do you handle the challenges if you can? Yes, yeah, so from what you are seeing, what is coming up is that there is an issue of communication and not only communication, but also getting the idea across the board between the different sectors, silo mentality by the individual partners in the One Health framework. Some challenges are very specific that they can't work with the medical officers, I don't know why. Competing priorities and interest by the different disciplines. Let's see what you're getting on. Ignorance of the wider picture, I don't know from the individual disciplines or ignorance about what we are pushing across. Technical jargon. I think maybe because of the different disciplines involved, misconception, overstepping, maybe Hector will ask our panelists how, how much they can step in when people are collaborating. There is also the issue of fear of uh, overstepping when people are collaborating. Yeah, funny enough, they say the vets and medics are hard to work, yet often they've said they're the ones who have been taking the One Health approach. 
they have been at the forefront. Yeah, so generally I think, and we can still get on the comments. We are now at 75, but since communication is the issue here and different disciplines. So keep, keep sending your, in, your inputs, then we can have it to, we can throw it to our panelists. All right, over to you, Eto. Thanks. Um, thank you so much for all of your comments. Um, we'd like to go back to the panel session now. Um, and this time we'd like to hear from uh, Jeanette and then Salome. So Jeanette, starting with you, how do you believe uh, we can bridge some of these gaps and improve transdisciplinary activities? So some of these challenges that we've mentioned in uh, One Health Research, I think they're a mirror of what we see when it comes to implementation of One Health strategies or, or projects in, in the public health sphere. So some of the things that uh, we can do perhaps in research can uh, be a roadmap for like when the government wants to implement uh, One Health strategies. What's coming out here from the discussion is that we exist in silos and there doesn't seem to be a platform where we can um, uh, collaborate. And even when there is, we'd maybe focus on human and animal, then we forget the environment, or we do human and the environment and then forget the, um, the vectors, forget the animals. But um, what I see is there is a possibility, especially in research institutes and I think universities, because they have the expertise in all of those areas. And so if they were to um, have a platform where you have the medical doctors, you have the vets, you have the ecologists, you have the entomologists, you have the parasitologists, some form or forum, and I guess this conference is one of them, where people can come together and have a shared vision on research. So it's not that when it comes to RVF, the vets are doing their thing, the medical doctors are doing their thing, the social scientists are doing their thing, and it's somehow uh, by, uh, by luck, we are moving in a certain direction, but it's not that we ever came together to have a shared vision on what we wanted to understand about Rift Valley fever. So therefore, the... Um, the development of a research platform that allows us mm -hmm. to, to col collaborate, I think is an important thing. Um, also to break these, these issues of, of the silos. Uh, one of the issues we face is funding. So funding for human health may be quite a lot. Uh, animal health will be slightly less, but if you look at the component that somebody could call One Health, you'll find that funding for that is much lower. But if we think of One Health as an approach, then it wouldn't make sense that, um, you know, a funder would, um, would fund One Health research to such a low extent. So it starts from there. I think uh, um, our advocacy so for what is important, us in the field of One Health research, we have to explain to the policymaker, to the funder, what is the relevance, what is the importance of One Health research so that they see its utility. And I think that also speaks to what uh, Dr. Eleanor was talking about. So there are these systematic reviews that are done. There's the animal component, but people don't seem to be interested in it. And perhaps it's in the fault of the researcher in that the research is not geared towards a policy question that the policymaker can, can relate to. So if we have a One Health research that is you know, uh, policy relevant, then perhaps then even when it comes to uh, the review of evidence, people will be calling on uh, One Health research. There's another element that's come out here quite strongly, and it's the fact that we need to be collaborative. I, it seems to be that perhaps in a lot of settings, a One Health researcher or a leader, uh, there are people with I believe a certain type of skill set, somebody who can manage to bring different disciplines together. I don't think that's something we assume, we should assume that everybody has the capacity to do. I think it's something that within pre-service training, um, it's something that we can build on. So that um, if you have a One Health outlook, you must know how to engage with people from other disciplines. Uh, how to use the information that comes from, from other disciplines. There's also the question here, or some of the comments here that have been put up is, you know, um, 
they feel like sometimes one health is beyond their expertise but one health you're not required to be an expert in everything uh, i don't think that's what the approach is about but the approach is about um having an awareness of some of these one health issues knowing what your role is knowing what the role of other people are uh, and how to you know refer or to communicate or to call on those additional resources in order to either um, answer a particular problem or answer um, uh, a research um, question. That's it. Thank you so much, Jeanette. Um, Salome, how do you propose we go about bridging some of these gaps? Um, I would like to share uh, an example from uh, uh, a research that we are currently conducting on gender inclusive vaccine ecosystem. And this brings in different disciplines to try and solve the issue of disease among communities and their livestock. So what, what has been happening is that each component has been going with their own, <clears throat> excuse me, each component has been running with their own component on their own. So for example, the veterinary um, team will go conduct their vet related activities, come back, the social scientists go, come back, and everyone does that. But one occasion made us stop and think, this is not going to work. So the veterinary team was going to do a vaccination for goats. And when they went, they realized the turnout was very low. And they were wondering, why is the turnout low? And they were, they were noting that there were just women, elderly women bringing the animals. And uh, before they went out for the field work, I had asked them, do, uh, can we accompany you? Can we have one of our members from our team to accompany you to just bring out those gender issues and the social cultural issues? And they said, no, we have incorporated some questions in our, in our questionnaire. But when they started the practice, they realized this is much way beyond what they had put on paper and what they were expecting. And so that evening they called us and said, please come, we need somebody from your team to join us. And so once we started working together, we are already seeing that, and, and the same has also happened to us before we've been training on um, gender issues and the sociocultural aspects. Then we realized questions come that involve veterinary related issues or other issues, and we can't answer them. So as a team, we've started working together, kind of gelling, such that when we go for an activity, we are all going together and uh, we have kind of the same vision, but each component is contributing something to the whole, but it's a, it's, it's a complete system, but each person is contributing something to that. So um, what I see is that as, as, as different disciplines, we when we look at One Health, we think, one health is usually, so long as there's somebody doing a, a specific thing, the vet, the health, the ecosystem related issues, we are good to go, that's one health. But it's more about the gelling. How do we gel all these things together? How do we fuse the expertise from the vet, the expertise from the uh, uh, ecologist, the ecosystem um, um, experts, expertise? How do we incorporate all those aspects so that then what we are bringing out is a holistic solution to improve the well-being of not just the humans, but also their animals and their ecosystems. So for me, I see there's the aspect of also looking at best practice. Do we have some of the research where One Health has been well ingrained and the outputs are there for us to show that this can be documented to showcase that this can actually work and that it may not have to cost so much, but if some of those teams or this best practice has been achieved with minimal engagement because we are now, um, when you go together, you ride on the, the resources are minimal rather than each team going at different times, but you uh, save on the resources. So that again is minimal, but you achieve great outputs. So having best practice, and then also just a key thing is still that coordination, coordinating, collaborating and communicating across each of the disciplines and looking at it within the wider context. And this is the local context in which we work in. Because if we do not take that into consideration and involve the communities we are working with, then whatever we are doing may not, we may not get uptake and adoption in the community. Yeah, so those are my thoughts. Uh, thank you so much. I like the, the, the thinking that it's about a journey and, and fusing all these various expertise together. Um, Jason, can you share some reflections from what you've heard or even share some of your own uh, ideas on some of the challenges you've faced? You know, one, one thing that I've been thinking about just now <clears throat> is timelines. Uh, and, you know, 
medical science, you, 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 give, you give a treatment or you stop exposure to a threat and you expect the, the benefit to, to be immediate, right? Which it, it generally is. The same in, in veterinary science. And probably you all could come up with a lot of examples why I'm wrong about that, but it's much more technical. The, the, the results are much more immediate. Uh, when it comes to land management, the, there's always a, a big time lag. You know, and that could be a relatively short time lag. So let's say if we want to talk about carbon sequestration under improved forages. So to take an example from my work, if this is in a humid highland region in Africa, then, you know, within three years, uh, we could measure a, 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 a significant change in the carbon stock uh, as, as a result of planting that, that fodder instead of, uh, instead of an annual crop. Uh, and whereas if I'm in a dry rangeland, if three years is far, is far too short, you know, you're looking more at 10 to 15 years. Uh, and so, uh, especially in uh, the, the 15 being more on the, the drier side, you know, deserts like, like Turkana here in Kenya or the Chalbi Desert, um, you know, very, very dry areas. You simply don't have, you know, a desert means you don't have a lot of rain, right? So things grow slowly, which means carbon is added to the ecosystem slowly, especially the soil. Uh, and so I think uh, realistic expectations about what results you expect and when um, is, is, a really, is a really key element. Um, so, yeah, I wanted to... Bring that bring that point up, uh, and it's and it's also it's not only that the that the, the timeline is is longer the, the the gains are are perhaps you know uh, not as guaranteed, um, and there's always a risk of backsliding. Although there's a risk of backsliding in in the case of any action, uh, and uh, and it involves a lot more all of these integrative factors, especially at places as complicated as, as pastoralist rangelands, of, of course. But, you know, you could say a lot of the same things about, uh, you know, human grasslands uh, here, here in the highlands, for example. And um, there's, still, there's still a lot of other factors that come, that come into play there uh, in terms of the, the actual land management. If you're going to improve the, the, the or shall I, shall, you know, improve the environmental benefits to public health or reduce the downsides of environmental conditions to public health. That's, it, it's, it's, gonna, it's gonna take longer than administering a vaccine or you know, something that's faster like that. And I'm not reducing all veterinary science or medical science to vaccines, obviously, but uh, I think everyone can see the, the value in that example. It's a lot more complicated when it comes to the ecosystem. Thanks. Jason, thank you so much. And thank you to our panelists for that um, really comprehensive um, discussion. Uh, what we'd like to do now, because we have a few minutes, is, is try and take some of the questions that have come through in the chat box. And um, feel free to put your hand up or jump in to our panelists who wants to answer that. Uh, we have a question that said, health veterinary services and environmental health services are devolved functions here in Kenya. So are there any thoughts on how to spur discussions and engagements with county governments whilst, while, while aware cognizant of completing, competing needs? Don't jump at once. So is uh, Dr. Muturi still in the room? Uh, that he would be, I think it would be really good to uh, lead on that because um, my feeling is that if you want something to be done, you have to provide a platform for people to move in that direction. So the same way we thought there should be, you know, um, when it comes to diseases, we need to have uh, an approach that looks at both human and animal health. And then there was a zoonotic disease unit that was developed somebody would argue then, is this reflected all the way to the county level, such that when you respond to outbreaks or there's an issue, you have both the, the, the medical doctor and the vet responding to it. And then if we want to incorporate the environment, I think the first one, because ZDU was leading the way in this, in ZDU, do they have uh, an environmental health person on board? Uh, and if they do, what has their experience been? Because I think that would be interesting to see how it could be replicated in the counties. Thank you, Jeanette. Um, we had a question on Menti that said, uh, is One Health sampling 
each domain or is it more? And if it is more than just ensuring that you've sampled from each of the domain, then what is it? Yes, go ahead. Uh, my name is Mark Nanyingi. I just wanted to jump in on the on the the ZDU's role and the establishment of the county one health unit. So in the recently developed one health strategic plan, what we are proposing is uh, what we call the county one health units. And this initially had been piloted by the CDC about uh, 2015, uh, but then with support from other partners, um, we are having an opportunity to uh, learn from what the Kenya Red, Red Cross has done in about nine counties in the country with their CP3 project. Uh, and then what we have developed, of course, with supporting the ZDU is a county one health curriculum, which actually trains people at the county level using standard one health approaches, but at the same time, actually trying to borrow governance that is at the top level of the ZDU to replicate what is happening at the national level and try to see on how we can integrate this at the county one health uh, Steer, steering committee. Some counties have gone further and developed their One Health policies, uh, but then we see this uh, sort of an approach that can gain more momentum from the county level and coming upwards so that we might have a One Health policy that has a, a governance fr framework uh, which looks at the coordination actually coming all the way from the top to the developed units. So that's what we are, I think I'll be talking uh, in, the, in the last day in one of my presentations. Thank you. Mark, thank you so much. We look forward to, to hearing a little bit more on that. Um, which brings me to the question that we were asking earlier um, in the Menti, which was, is One Health just sampling each of the systems or is it more than that? And if it is, then what does that entail? Uh, yes, I mean, it, it's not even sampling in each of the domains. I think, you know, if we're talking about research, we we sometimes sample. Sometimes we collect other types of of data, metadata about the about the individuals, about the environment in which we're working. And one health might simply be collecting the right additional data to go with your sample from an animal. It doesn't necessarily mean you have to also sample from the human and also take a soil sample and a leaf sample and an air sample. It it definitely it, it means putting what you're doing in the context of everything else, not necessarily trying to collect something from everything else all of the time. If, if that's what we were doing, it would be an endless circle and it would never end. And we, we would end up with so much data. It would be very hard also to understand how those different, different data are linked to each other, but it's about context. If I'm collecting this, how do, do these other things that exist in the universe where this thing that I'm collecting comes from, how do those things influence the result that I find? And, and that's why it's an approach rather than a discipline, because we, we have to conceptualize what we're doing in a broader context without trying to do everything all at once, because if we do that, we'll be nowhere. Yeah. Thank you, Eric. Um, we have another question saying collaborative approaches need time, energy, and long-term commitment. How can institutions and funders better support One Health approaches? Eleanor, would you like to take that? That's a challenging question, Hector. <laughs> uh, quite challenging. Um, so um, collaboration, um, it has even been put a lot on the on Menti that collaboration is a challenge. The silo culture is a challenge in many institutions. And I know I've been in, in, I've been in many forums in evidence-based decision making where again the same issue of silo um, silo mentality is constantly raised, constantly raised. So I think it's just making small steps, collaborate searching first by collaborative research. Uh, and in, for example, I'll just um, bias towards the work I do uh, when it comes to decision making, um, making sure that uh, those at the panel um, uh, cut across different um, sectors and areas. So that really helps. Uh, for example, I've been involved in other projects where panelists were very diverse. Um, so that really helped in just contextualizing um, 
the work and the collaborative effort was really amazing. And it was very interesting how uh, the, you know, the views of this group are so different, but yet everything was extremely important. So uh, uh, institutions and groups have to be intentional. Uh, they should not sit back and wait for it to happen organically. Many people talk about it and hope that it will happen organically. So it, uh, people have to be intentional for, from researchers, even from funders and funding calls, being intentional on that type of research. Um, and not to say that nothing is being done. I know I've come across some funding calls where the funders have stressed for this particular call, we expect a transdisciplinary approach. So the teams that were successful are those that were successful at presenting a transdisciplinary team and approach. So not just about the team, but the approach and the skill set that the team was bringing to the table. So that's all I can say about that, but it's a very difficult question to answer. Eleanor, thank you so much for trying, appreciate that. Um, so we'd like to close by just sort of saying that, yes, it's a challenge. We've heard about the challenge. You have shared all the challenges as well. Uh, but if we continue to keep going at it, as uh, Salome pointed out, this is about the journey. Um, and hopefully through training and effective communication, we'll all be able to be better One Health advocates. Uh, on that note, I'd like to thank the panelists uh, for participating. Thank you very much. Um, and over to Nick for another mentee. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hector, the panelists, and also our attendees for that. So we love our final question, our final mentee discussion, where we'd want to hear how the one thing that you do differently after listening to all the talks, the panel discussions, and all the emerging thoughts from, from this, either in collaboration, funding, communication, and from all the insights that we've had today. How the one thing, only one thing that you do differently in while conducting your One Health research. Yes, somebody says they'll approach it dif differently. They'll promote more teamwork. Avoid the silo thinking. They'll consult with other disciplines, communicate effectively. Somebody says they'll speak more about the environment. Jason, are they resonating with your thoughts? They'll speak more about, while well, doing One Health, they'll speak more about the environment sector. They'll involve the community, very important, like we saw for the NAROC study. Collaborate and collaborate more. Undertake joint interventions, yes, that's very good. Not just do an intervention and walk away. Some will champion for One Health. Yeah, so generally we are getting we are getting a feel that people will now communicate more, collaborate more, engage with each other, com and communicate better. So, and I think to our session leads, I think this was one of the outcomes that they were looking for. So I'd welcome Dr. Lian and Dr. Thumbi to close. <laughs> Karibu. Great. So I think we've come to the end of a, a really exciting day and there's certainly been a lot of um, things for us to take away and think about. Um, one is that we're on a journey that we can do things better and we need to communicate, communicate and collaborate. Um, and I hope that this, uh, this conference and this forum has been one of the ways in which we um, start to, to do that. Thumbi, is there any reflection from you? Uh, I think the first one is just to appreciate that we have had more than 300 at any single time people attending these, these sessions, which I think is fantastic, given, um, you know, the, our current status. So I think we are really taking advantage of the online, um, online opportunity. The, the talks have been fantastic, uh, and I really enjoyed the discussions that, you know, coming from the panelists this, this afternoon. And I think one, one nice thing I noted is I don't think any of the panelists is a vet, which is finally people who are not necessarily vets, you know, so embracing, <laughs> which is great. Excellent. Yes, we, I think um, despite the, the times of pandemics and COVID, we've certainly shown today that we can have an interesting and stimulating discussion with a lot of participants online. And we really thank everybody who's been able to join, give their valuable time to being here in person or being online um, and to all our esteemed
panelists, speakers, those who provided these really wonderful flash talks. Anyone who wants to catch up, go back over presentations, please um, keep an eye on our website. The recordings will be made available there towards the end of the week. Keep uh, engaged with the conversation through Twitter, and um, we very much look forward to seeing you all again tomorrow um, for our, our next discussions where we're going to deep dive on um, mainstreaming gender in One Health and looking at our capacity strengthening um, requirements. Um, and I'll pass to Thumbi for the last word and we'll close, thank you. I think we should thank the IT team and uh, Nick and, and the team for really helping us with this uh, organization. We appreciate it. Well done. Enjoy your evening and see you tomorrow. <laughs>